Welcome yep. to Kilts and Culture. I Our am Rocky. Intro is there right, right now. Victorian England had a huge influence well on the fashions and styles cool. that were happening in the Highland dress in Scotland. Tartan is Scotland's gift to the world, but and it is your personal say, heritage yeah, story. <clears throat> exactly. Well, uh, and Howdy, boys and girls. Welcome to Kilts and Culture. I am Rocky. This is Eric. Yo. Hope you enjoyed our new little intro thing there. Today, special treat. Redemption. This is the High Rye Bourbon Single Barrel Select. This is given to us by Kerry Rogan or Rohan or Rogan. Not sure exactly how to say his last name, but by a wonderful. <laughs> hi, Kerry. Yes, hi, Kerry. It's always just Kerry for it's, us. Yes, yeah, exactly. Like... The first name basis. Carry um, on. Carry on. Yes. So today we are going to try. Whoop. I didn't do my my force uh, power thing. This is I know. Worse every I know. time. Oh, it is. It is. I'm horrible at this now. All right. We need the effects department to step in and do something about this. Indeed, indeed. All right. So, this is a bourbon whiskey, I believe. Is this bourbon? Which is a, yep. It's rye bourbon. Like a rye-ish bourbon, I think. I have no idea. Someone handed it to me, and I ingested it. Or will ingest it. That's kind of how I roll. With some rye commentary. Uh, uh, it's about even. It's good. It's yeah. good. It's good. Dude. Pretty. It's pretty. I can see it on the monitor. Right. It looks Mr. really Matt, pretty. Mr. Matt, if you will come collect this for Mac. Thank you, sir. Yoink. Exactly. Exactly. Just going to hand that over to Mac over in the back there. I'm going to screw this whole what thing up. What are you up. doing? Oh, dude, I'm making a mess. It's, it's horrible. No, don't make a mess. All right, fair. I won't make a mess. Let's try to make it look pretty. Try to do bottle. something different at the last second. He's changing the whole format no, of the no, show. No, I'm not. They're right now. Before. Look, look. No, look. Throw that down there. You've never it. done that before. Roll the footage. You've never turned the table like that before. I'm sure of it. At least twice. In the last episode, and I think the one before that. Whatever. I tried to do it so they could see our kilt and our tartan a little bit more. Oh, I see, I see. All right. What tartan do you think we're wearing? You'll find out shortly. Um, the uh, Okay. We're going to do this. going to do this first. Then we're going to announce our new tartan. So... Redemption, high rye, high wire act whiskey, single barrel <laughs> thing. I don't know. There we go. I'm very respectful of the name. All right. It's going to be a day. It's, oh, it's going to be a day. Lack of sleep and a lot of caffeine. 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 Caffeination. Exactly. All right, Mac. What are you so, getting on the nose there? In, in the nose, it, vanilla wafer, rye spice, and a hint of everyone's favorite fruit, red. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to know, if somebody actually drinks whiskey and scotch and bourbon and stuff like that, what the hell is red fruit? <laughs> it just says red. Last show they did it, this show did it, like, I want, I want like, I know, oh, this like, shoot is more of, like, this fruit's more of a chartreuse. I mean, it could be, like, What's berries, the... it could be an apple, it could be a kumquat, I don't know. I know. Can, well, next one, can we get, like, a yellow fruit? I know, that's what I'm saying. Like, like, I, I, I want chartreuse. Yeah. <laughs> Cantaloupe. Just yeah. no honeydew. Uh, honeydew is horrible. It's the best Honeydew is child. the place filler. It yes. The, oh, it yeah. fills up the excess yeah. space. It's the zero of fruits. All right. So I, I can get some vanilla. Nice. Definitely sweet. It's very sweet. So I'm getting a lot of a, like a nice caramelly tone. Slightly leathery tone. It's actually a more active nose than I remember from the last couple ones. You're there. My sense of smell is better today than it has been. I'm smelling a lot of alcoholy. Like, I'm smelling... It's, it, it smells like burning. I don't know. <laughs> um, all right. Give a sip. Very burning. Oaky. Yeah. Oak. Yeah. Very, very sweet. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm spitting out acorns. It's so oaky. It's it's elegant oak. Of all the oaks, it's the mm. elegant. It's the elegant oak. Okay. Yeah. And crisp cherries with black pepper. Pepper, yeah. yes. Yeah. Cherries, Again, I don't know. Pepper... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the cherry a little bit. Yeah, the pepper is that euphemism for it yeah. burns. It burns. <laughs> and then the finish lingering and smooth seasoned wood faint mint 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 <coughs> <coughs> smooth um that's not that's not that's not the uh 
the whiskey is my reaction to the amazing new graphic. Oh, it took me by surprise. It was delicious. Mm -hmm. um, a delicious graphic. Um, I'm getting a little bit of the cherry. Like I'm getting a fruit. A maybe, little bit. Maybe that's the red fruit. That's the red Could fruit. Be. The red fruit is cherry. Who knew? Ding, ding, maybe ding. it's like the mystery fruit. No, I'm assuming. I want to have a duck come down. You know, like Groucho Marx. You know, yes. Say, say this here, why one thousand dollars? Indeed. <laughs> Big black painted on mustache. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We have like there's a there's a secret tasting note, and if we <laughs> guess it, the duck comes down. <laughs> <laughs> we could totally rig this up now. No, no. I'm looking at the, the like the the scaffolding stuff mm -hmm. up there. We could totally rig this up. Or we should make it more. We should make make it more uh, Scottish or something, and have like a stuffed Highland coup, like a, a mm -hmm. stuffed Kylo come down from the now now. We have a, now see, sound effect. And I'm, I'm going off the rails now. I want to see like Matt in like the the Mission Impossible outfit, like descend <laughs> from the ceiling, and he's like floating he above the ground. He looks a little like Tom Cruise. I, I, actually, we could do it. We could do it. Yeah. You trust us, Matt. It's fine. <laughs> we don't get paid enough for this. Oh uh, yeah, we'll 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 water it just a so, touch. Just a little bit of water. Just to cut the cut the burny. Cut the right burny. now. I I don't mind it. I'm kind of digging it. Yeah, it's it's very thick. It has a very heavy mouthfeel. Okay. I think that goes with the sweetness. I'm picking up what you're putting down. <clears throat> Yeah, I'd rather like this one. Maybe I'm more of a bourbon person than I realized. Yeah, um, as far as bourbon goes, it's not bad. Yeah, I'm not a bourbon person, but well, I have you, I have had rye on occasion, not regularly, okay. but and I have some rye in the cabinet for mixing with. But I'm not saying it's a good one. It's like this is this is giving me the uh, summer campfire s'mores. Yeah, little little bit of this. Yep. I could see that. I could see that. Well, maybe graham cracker is one of the tasting notes I should have added. Mm. Get so, on that redemption high rye whiskey wire. Where are they located? This Bloomington, Burkin? Indiana. Indiana. Okay. Well, Gordon, yeah, bourbon. Okay. okay. And we have uh, Cameron uh, Waldron is saying red fruit hey. is referencing cranberry, cherry, strawberry, etc. So it is literally cranberry, all the red ones, cherry. <sighs> Strawberry, except etc. Et so just fill in the, yeah, sweet berryness. <laughs> These are not the berries you're looking for. I mean, come on, that's a what a cop. It's a cop out. Yeah, it's it's. I don't know what it tastes Red like. Fruits. It's kind of all of it. It's like cranberries and, and cherries or anything. Then just like. say fruit punch. <laughs> like, eh, slap some fruit punch in there. It's fine. <laughs> How about some nice Hawaiian whiskey? <laughs> when did they move from Indiana to Boston? There. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's. It's all of them. It's all of them. <laughs> it's been a long week, Mac. Cut uh, us some oh, slack. Yes, it has. <laughs> it's been a really long week. <laughs> it's not over. <laughs> I mean, over till it's over. <laughs> all right. Um, how do you feel about it, Mr. Mac? Give us your score, 1 to 10. I'm still trying to figure out if I like it or not. Like, I'm, like... <sighs> he's looking at the glass like he's not sure which end to drink out. Yeah. <laughs> um... <laughs> I think I'm still gonna go like, like seven one. Oh, it, that that high. Okay. I did it change for you with the water? It did. It took a like a little bit. I think it almost heightened a little bit of the pepperiness for me. For I agree. Um, I agree. Kind of made it like the it like mellowed it out, but then like add a little bit of a more of an upkick to it. Yep. For me. Okay. It brought out some of the bitterness, I think. Yeah. It cut the sweetness and brought out some of the bitterness. I like the word bitter. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's definitely, I'm getting a little bitter it's back bitter. of the mouth. Like That's, that's the woody, partly the woodiness the for me. Yeah, the okay. oaky. Okay. I see that. So 7-1. Going 7-1. All right, Eric. I'll do 6.7. 6.7. It's not bad. Yeah. It's not bad yeah. at all. I'm going to go 63 which is for me a strong score for rye. Very. Or for for bourbon. Yeah. 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 yeah indeed. Yeah. yeah. Not bad. Thanks, Gary. Thank you very much, Gary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Very good stuff. He's opening our eyes to a whole new world. Yes. All right. Now now the question is, when I am done this, do I drink more of this or do I go to my backup scotch in case backup scotch in case I do not want to have more of that? Oh, that, yeah. Is that the scotchy scotch? It's the scotch, the scotch, scotch, of, exactly. Of scotch. That's the Dalmore. That's good stuff. 
All right. Go ahead, Delmore. So, you've all been wondering. We've teased it for days and hours and stuff. What tartan are we wearing today? Mr. Eric, we are, and I both, and Mac, back behind the camera, are wearing the American Dream Tartan. It is a new tartan that we designed. Um, we are uh, very, very proud of this one. It took a lot of thought and effort to come up with it. We made a little uh, video we want to share with you guys now. America is known as the land of opportunity. And as we approach our semi-quincentennial anniversary, we began reflecting on what makes America good. Over the last 250 years, why have so many people come to this place in search of a better life? Since our founding in 1776, America has held out a promise to the world, an ideal that we're guided by to this day, the American dream. These simple words encapsulate a concept rooted in optimism and hope. The idea that no matter your ethnicity, your race, your religion, in this place, everyone is able to work towards a better life. Here, your talents and vision and determination shape your own future. Personal freedom and hope, that's the lamp beside the golden door. That's what attracted our immigrant ancestors to America and continues to attract people from all over the world today. We wanted to design a tartan to celebrate that vision of America. For the origins of the American dream, we incorporated 76 blue threads to represent the year our founders made this promise. We included a gold stripe as a nod to Lady Liberty's torch. At the red pivot, we have 13 red stripes to symbolize the original 13 colonies. We utilized three shades of red and three shades of blue to represent the varied backgrounds and experiences of all Americans, those who suffered hardships to work toward their vision of the American dream. This depth and diversity of colors woven together celebrates a beautiful effect, not unlike our country itself. Look, I'm not saying that America's perfect, far from it, but I truly believe that this country has been for centuries and continues to be a beacon of hope. We hold ourselves accountable as good people by using the American dream as our North Star. It's the manifestation of the Founding Fathers' words that we're all created equal with the rights to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. It's the promise of the American dream that makes us good and gives others hope. And we feel that's worth celebrating. So I hope you guys like that. That is the uh, new American Dream Tartan. The when we started thinking about the uh, we started thinking about this tartan back in March, March or so this year. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we started thinking about um, the 250th, you know, the sesqu semi sesqu semi centennial. Semi -sesqu yeah, yeah. What it, you know, the 250th anniversary of the U.S. coming up, um, and trying to think about what, how do we celebrate in a time where there's so much political division, stress, you know, just general bad vibes, you know, negativity from every angle. How do we as a nation kind of gather behind an idea? What idea can we all kind of get behind? And that's when we kind of thought of, you know what, the, the single good thing about America it, that everyone should be able to get behind is the ideal of the American dream. So that's kind of where we, where we took it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean the, the 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 flag symbolism is there. The the, the colonial symbolism is there, which is almost like uh, sounds like you'd have to do something like that. You know, what yeah. I mean, you got. I mean, how it, it's it, you got you got red, white, and blue to work with. So changing it up so you actually get some extra oomph into yeah. that. Yeah, to, you a, know, to really an attractive it design. It's yeah. yeah, it's difficult to do a red and white, a red and blue design, and not have it just look purple. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. which I think you did very well, by the way. That was when Thank I remember you. when I first saw it. it was like it did not, you don't get the purple, yeah, the purple mesh. No, I'm, for lack I'm of a word. very so. pleased with how it came out. Yeah. So, what is your? Does do you have any either family, personal immigrant stories or American dream stories? Oh, you're stories? asking me. Sure. Okay. Why not? Um, <clears throat> the personal one would be the fact that my great was it great great grandfather Munz Munderson emigrated from Bergen back in the uh, mid 19th century and the family settled in uh, uh, Chicago and my great grandfather actually uh, was both a doctor and also set up a flower shop there and they were noted for developing a, uh, a new hybrid <clears throat> brown colored iris 
didn't take <laughs> off. <laughs> um, basically, yeah. That's that's that's. There's a lot of weird little yeah vignettes about my family, but that's one that's always stuck with me. You know, wow. so nice. Yeah, my uh, uh, my family. A lot of my family has been here since like either civil war or even you know some revolutionary war. You know, uh, people people were here before the revolutionary war. Mm -hmm. So there's I don't, my immigrant story, so to speak, is lost, or the people who came over from Ireland or from England. Um, there's not as much of a a story about it, but the one that kind of sticks out in my mind, I'll say the American dream type story, is uh, my great grandfather, the man, one of, you know, the man I'm named after. Um, he was 12 years old when he lost his father, and he was literally on the way home from the funeral with his brothers and sisters and his mom, and his mom turned to him and said, well, Bill, you're the man in the house now. You're going to have to get a job, and <clears throat> he started out working sweeping floors at a factory and I called my mom but she didn't get back to me yet so I, I forget the name of the company but he started off sweeping floors at a factory and worked which is kind of a bit surreal in today where mm -hmm. you, you switch jobs every two years or so mm -hmm. but he worked in that factory sweeping floors from age 12 and ended up retiring as president of the company at you know later much much later in life so it's to me that is kind of the the American dream story through necessity. It, it, he was forced, mm -hmm. you know, back against the wall through tragedy, you know, lost his the father in his family, and he just had to go out and do something, and okay, gotta do it, let's go. And ended up just, you know, his entire life at the same company. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that to me is the, is, you know, part of the inspiration of the whole thing is mm -hmm. being able to not just be static in life, but progress along. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I only just thought of this from the way you phrase it, but um, <clears throat> necessity is the mother of invention is kind of a a theme with this. A lot of the people who the 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 the, the immigration stories for this country don't start in a good place. You know, they start mm -hmm. in like in, in famine or population pressure or economic pressure or you know much much worse. And uh, it's it's basically you're 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 there's a there's a point of desperation you're at. Yes, you know, but you but you find a way to to to, to make your vision of what's going to be better come to life. Yeah, and it takes more than one person a lot of time too. I think is the other thing is like we like to we like to <coughs> like you you talked about your was it great grandfather? Yeah, yeah, and I talked about my great grandfather actually, but a lot of time it's it's a it's a family thing. You know, I mean it's it's I mean I think about the support structure and everything involved. Yep. Well, yeah, and just and generational too. Like um, a really great example to me is um, Chinatown in san francisco mm -hmm. i mean holy cow the, the the shit that those people went through when they came here but then um they built this thriving they, they took what was essentially a, a ghettoized community and they turned it into this jewel this economic and cultural jewel that it is now and it's just like it took huge amount of determination a huge amount of grit and and intergenerational support to mm -hmm. make it happen and and, and there, there are other places in the world where you can do that but it's not not like here. Yeah. So it's the it's the the freedom. It's the ability to chart your own course, to plot your own destiny, to say that's where I'm going and yeah. go and do it. Whether you need help doing it through a community like that, or whether you're just like an entrepreneur just starting it out, yeah. I want to do my own thing. That's where I'm going to go. Yeah. It's that is to us, or at least to me. I won't speak for you. That is to me what is good about America is our ability to go and you know have that fostered within us mm -hmm. and the ability yeah. for you know us to to just do what we want to do the personal freedom involved in it. yeah i think i think yeah. it's, i think it's an attitude of um owning that you're an underdog but deciding you're going to win you yeah know what i mean yeah accountability yeah, personal yeah. accountability absolutely yeah it's it's on me i'm going to do this let's go and setting an example yeah you know it's like a, i'm sure you know the, the the values that came down to your through your family from your great grandfather and all that you yeah know? so indeed it's complicated but it's it is it is inspiring and it's it's you gotta cling to that i think yeah we need something to look forward to something to look up to some kind of hope something to aspire to and to me this does that yeah indeed. also we happen to think it's a it's a beautiful tartan 
<clears throat> oh yeah, that's it. Uh, <laughs> but no, that was all of the inspiration for us going into it. Was how do we kind yeah. of encapsulate this this feeling, this emotion, this positivity, this you know this yeah. this ideal that we're aspiring to, and, and get past the cliche. Yeah, you know what I mean. I mean, it's so easy to get into you know cliches about America, you know, and, and yeah, America like, is good or America is bad or blah right. blah. You know, you have like Pat Boone singing the national anthem or whatever, but it's like no, there's there's it's it's more nuanced, and I think the color really does it justice. In, in my, oh, hey, check it out. We're showing it off. There here. it is. Ta-da. Very, very pretty. Kudos to our team, by the way, who you don't see on camera, who have done a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to get the uh, the kilts we're wearing made and get these photos put together and get the commercial you saw made. It has been a Herculean effort on everybody's part. This is a, yeah. It's been a big deal. We got the first yeah. run of fabric what, a week and a little over a week ago, and we've mm -hmm. we've done a lot. <laughs> yeah. We are doing a lot. Yeah. Nothing is ever last minute. We're fine. We're fine. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right, boys and girls, load in your questions. Well, first of all, I will say this: the American Dream Tartan is live on USA Kilts website. So, if you are interested, if you do want to see it, go check out the website. It is available for sale. We do have cloth in stock right now. So that's as much commercial as right. we're going to do about it right. for right now. But we are asking you, please, please load your questions in. Mm -hmm. What do you want to know, either about this or about kilts or about culture, any of it? We are but your humble servants here to answer all of your questions. We now return you to your regularly scheduled Kilts and Culture broadcast. Indeed. Um, Mr. Eric, what do we got first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, honestly, the first question that we had at the top of the list was Jen Zemish asking, how did you come up with some of the tartans you created? <laughs> I think we pretty much already answered that. Um, well, it's... It, I would sometimes it's that serious a... Uh, 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 Oh, kind of a deep thought. And other times it's just like, you know what? That'd be freaking cool. Yeah. You know what I it's mean? Designing tartans, um, what, you know, and we're not going back. I'm not, I'm not selling you on this or anything else. Just designing tartans for me. Generally here, I'm the one who typically designs the tartan. But it's generally my, my creative process, so to speak, is more of a round table discussion where I'll come up with an idea, I'll come up with concepts, and I'll kind of bounce it off a few different people, and then I'll see what their reactions are to it. I'll see if this is, um, if I want to tweak anything and move in a slightly different direction, if I can defend the idea and mm -hmm. I like this or like mm -hmm. that, or if somebody has a different uh, angle on something or something I haven't thought of and I can kind of incorporate it into the design itself. Mm -hmm. So for Kilts and Culture Tartan, um, when we designed that, I actually designed four, I think four different ones with yeah, some with more or less colors. Mm -hmm. For that one, I literally started with the Scott Green Weathered Tartan because that was my wedding tartan. I wore that one a lot. It gets a lot of comments through, you know, pictures on the websites, through when we put the, the image and videos, that kind of stuff. So I said, okay, these colors are winners. Let me now use these colors and this general palette and this idea and then completely rip it apart and do it you know as a new tartan mm -hmm. so that one was more color based and feeling based when it's something like the firefighter memorial which my wife did yeah the um that one we used um we wanted to use specific colors for specific meaning mm -hmm. and at the same time we wanted to use the number 343 for the 343 firefighters that died on 9 11. so since unfortunately, you know, it's a high number, but it's also a palindrome. It's the same forward and backwards. We could use it as a pivot point in the tartan, so we were able to do that mm -hmm. with that number. So it just it gives more, more meaning and more, you know, it, it gravitas. Yeah, more gravitas. Thank you. It gives more meaning, more gravitas to the tartan, and it just kind of it makes people connect with it on a deeper emotional level. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Clan tartans, if you if you look at <clears throat> tartans, you know, across time, so to speak, and you start with the original clan tartans, they were really more like de facto district tartans. They were just designs. Right. And then, you know, you had the Black Watch tartan, which, you know, stood for something as in the military. And then it, it kind of evolved through just different patterns for clans. Then when you get into the 1950s, the first example of a tartan of, of ascribed meaning to particular colors that we, at least that we know of and we can document, is the Nova Scotia tartan in 1953. So over time, it's kind of evolved from a, a fun fashion-y thing 
to a symbol of a family or to a symbol of a district, to a symbol of a family. And then there people are just looking for more and more deeper meaning within it. Yeah. Which kind of evolved into the, okay, this color is for the sky and this color is for the sea and this color is for the, the rolling hills or whatever. Or a blend of colors sometimes. Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's kind of evolved over time. And that's one of the the beautiful evolutions of Tartan. There's a lot of not not beautiful evolutions within it, but <clears throat> one of the beautiful evolutions is the meaning that is ascribed to certain things. It's not just, eh, that's a pretty tartan. So that's now a thing. It's people are putting more thought and effort into the meaning behind things. Yeah, I, it's there, there's a kind of a poetic quality to it. I think most people, when they design tartans these days, it's the it's very definitely the latter of your description is that like um, they'll look at the cut like Isle of Skye is always my favorite example because you know she was very much inspired by um, the colors of the landscape there you know to, to come up with what she wanted for that tartan yeah, beautiful and tartan. most people you know like you look at like uh, local geographical tartans nowadays it, it will be literally like the green of the fields of corn and the blue of the sky and yada 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 I have a tartan that I am working on that is inspired by a very specific colored object. I don't know if I should reveal it or not. Because you'll hate me for doing it. I'll hate you for doing it. You're right, so don't. <laughs> okay, I won't. But I, 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 will, I would look forward to seeing your design. I've never seen I you look design a I look forward to you refining my design to something that we can actually <laughs> offer to people. Fair point. Mm -hmm. It's You sell yourself short. I'm sure you'll come up with a good design. DM me. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, but that's that's it. Basically, people want to make it more poetic. But you don't have to. I mean, you can literally just take, like, you know, the favorite colors off of a seat cover in your house and turn it into a tartan. If you like how it looks, then ta-da, you got a tartan. Yeah. They, you know? There can be as much or as little meaning in it yeah. as don't, you want. Don't like it stuff. Don't feel yeah. like you have to. You yeah. Know don't, I mean? don't, don't experience paralysis just because, oh, mm -hmm. I'm like, I really, really like this color, but I have to think of what it means to us. It's, it's not like that. It's you can do as little or as much thought mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and put it into the tartan design. We could have come up with 897 different ways to add meaning and thoughts into the American Dream tartan. We didn't. We didn't want to handicap ourselves by saying, OK, I want 15 points of meaning. If you do that, then you're stuck with particular things in the design. So there's a lot of meaning, but maybe the design doesn't look as good. Yeah. So you yeah. want to have a balance of a good design and meaning. Yeah, and you don't want you want you don't want to go so far that like you tip the scale into like the, your 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 personal bullshit detectors going off. It's like really, <laughs> it's yeah. like it it gets a little purple, a little bit purple prose sometimes yeah. if you try too hard. So. And it's it's art. Bottom line right. is it's art. Right. It's you're always gonna see the artist to some degree may have to explain why they did certain things or used certain objects. Like I'm thinking like painting art. Um, people have to sometimes explain why they did certain things. Other times people will just read into it what they want to read into it. That's true. So there's, there's the element of allowing personal exploration within an art object, sure. whether it's tartan, whether it's a painting, yeah. um, as well as what the artist actually meant and just explaining what they meant. Mm hmm Indeed. So, I hope that helps. First shaggy dog of the day. Exactly. <laughs> All right, Mr. Mac. <clears throat> what do we have Mac. from Mac, the look audience, up. folks? Look up. So, we do have a question from the Tiki Talks. Ooh! So, Hippie Witch 1. Not Hippie Witch 7. No. Oh, good. This good. is the mm. one Hippie Witch. Oh, there oh, is I only hate one. Hippie Witch 7. All those others I've met at festivals are fakes. Indeed. Yeah. He wants to know... Or they, they, they want to know because we don't we don't know what they are. Anyway. Yes, <laughs> uh, is there a difference between Mick or Mac with last names? If not, why is there a difference? It's a good question. We've from always a, never asked us that. Yeah, from a very 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 broad brush kind of take on it, it would be, and this is not true in every single instance, but it's as a as again a broad brush kind of thing. Mick is generally speaking. Irish. Mac is generally speaking Scottish. O is also an Irish, like O Kelly mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, o <coughs> slash Mick slash Mac essentially means son of or of. Right. So it's the shorthand for like John O, you know, or Seamus O Kelly is 
Seamus of Kelly, like yeah, the son his of Kelly. mom, yeah, son of Kelly. Yeah. Um, so it's that's how it kind of evolved over time, and it tends to be tends to be Irish or mixed and Scottish or Max. Yeah, I mean it's a it's kind of the 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 subtle variances between uh, that you sometimes see between uh, Irish Gaelic and Scots Gaelic. Essentially, is is my understanding. Mm-hmm. Now, how many how many of the mix in Ireland were families that came over from Scotland, like to Northern Ireland? I I, I don't know. Opposite. How many mix in Scotland or came over from Ireland? Is that what you meant? No. How many Max came from Scotland over to like? Okay, Ulster? you said Mick. That's why I'm asking. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, there was a, yeah, there was a lot of Scots in Ulster. Yes. Mick, yeah. Mac, yeah. Paddy Whack. Um, <laughs> Let's call the whole thing off. Give it. Yeah. Give give your dog bone um yeah i don't know i don't know what how far back that goes i mean oh kelly oh neil is ex- is extremely old that yeah. that that is that is that was originally one of the ways you differentiated the um families of noble lineage in ireland um which is why the the o'neills were like the ruling clan you know all that but um in terms of mac versus mick i don't know when mick arose as a convention hmm. i'm curious about that so anybody who's good with the uh, etymology or Gallic, let me know. I'd be interested to know. Indeed. When it became a thing. Yeah. It became a thing at some point. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a thing, now it is a thing. And which way did they go? Or did yeah. they go both ways across the water? Yeah. So. All right. Mr. Eric. Yeah. That's a really good question, actually. Here it is. We, have to re- we need to research <clears throat> that more. Um, hey, you're paying me. I'll research whatever you want. Sweet. Wait. <laughs> Damn it. Uh... Mr. Randy Collins asked us, uh, oh, he says, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for creating this platform where, so there could be some social interaction among the culture of the Celtic community. So we, didn't, we did not do it alone, but <laughs> without the community, um, there would we, be no community. <laughs> right. There wouldn't be us. <laughs> so um, thank you all. Uh, my question is, what direction do you see uh, the Celtic heritage scene heading and what can we do to keep the flames of interest and curiosity building? So, hmm. we've commented on this before a few times, but it's always an interesting thought. What direction is it heading? Um, North, northeast-ish. That's a fair point. We're <clears throat> up 95. Um, <laughs> Following the trade winds. Um, the <clears throat> what direction is it heading? I don't. It's heading the same direction it's always been heading. You're talking family, if we're talking family lineage stuff and just passing down stories and passing down, you know, culture and that kind of thing, I think it's going the same direction. Mm -hmm. So I Mm -hmm. don't think that direction would massively change because it's it's your own, on a personal level, on a family level. I don't think it's even a direction. It's just like, it's that's where it doesn't move. That's the... That's the, the, the that's the linchpin. That's the constant. That's what yeah. makes it a culture in the first place. Yeah. <clears throat> the uh, hmm. What do you think? I'm gonna I'm gonna pontificate. What do you think? For once, I don't feel like I have any really super amazing thoughts on this one, but I think I'll say it's becoming more heterogeneous and it's actually getting more colorful. I think there's um, as people from Gallic backgrounds spread out across the world largely due to the British Empire, um, they encountered different parts of the world and different cultures, and there's been interaction and intermarriage all all over the world. And that, so there's a little touch of Gaelic culture in a lot of different places, and there's a lot of cross-pollination. So I think we were just talking about tartans. I think the fact that you see so many tartans now that um, are made by people to represent something which ostensibly has nothing to do with Scotland. The Ukraine tartan. You know? and like like the Ukraine. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but the point is that that cultural nugget, that cultural art form Symbolism. of tartan is translatable into other contexts. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing is basically that um, in the digital age, as cultures are able to interact with each other more, um, there's more variety of expression. So I think, and I, I think you see this in the music also. Like uh, witness the fact that uh, one of our favorite bands, Albanach, who are basically traditional, like, they call it tribal pipes and drums, um, and they start off as like kind of a street performer act in Edinburgh, I think. But Glasgow in Glasgow, or Edinburgh. Oh. But but the point it's is, their one. thing their thing is this very tribal, um, almost a mythic proportion kind of like ideal of Scottish warrior music. You know, like you know, like you know, battle pipes and war drums and blah. And it's very high blood and stuff. And then a few years back, they added a didgeridoo as part of their uh, as part of their instrument lineup. Mm-hmm. 
There's no didgeridoos in Scotland. <laughs> yeah, so so they got the idea from somewhere. Unless Drew's there, there's at least at least one. That's <laughs> oh, how is didgeridoo? I haven't seen them in a long time. Um, but but you, you take my meaning. Is the point is is that um, it's it's a cooler sound now. They've added dimension to it. So I think we're seeing more dimension. Um, I would I'm, even I would even go more basic. Dropkick Murphys or the Real Mackenzies yeah. or the yeah. Pogues taking traditional Irish influenced or Scottish influenced music mm -hmm. and injecting it into rock and roll or punk rock kind of music. Yeah. Even even those cross pollinations, mm -hmm. it's it's mm -hmm. just a fun mixture of different stuff. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, I think the uh, it, it's just it, it's getting more popular because people are more easily able to find it. I think is what's happening now. Um, naysayers out there will say, well, you're just going to water down the culture by doing that. It's like, no, I don't think so. I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in diffusion. <coughs> I went to school for anthropology, and, and uh, so I, I, I'm a big believer in cultural diffusion and uh, cross-pollination creating new and cooler ideas. I will, more color. Yes, I will. I will put in. You're, you're starting to go where I was about to go with it. I'm going to be all hands today. Yes, and I know they're back there laughing because they saw me doing it earlier. I don't know. I saw you guys laughing at me. Um, the uh, it's fine. Everyone laughs at me. The uh, I laugh at me. The one thing I was thinking about was yes, I I like the the. I'm of two minds. I like having things that are, um, that stand on their own, that are pure for purity's sake, and experiencing sure. the one thing. Right. I also and understand in timeless. Correct. I also like having things intermingled and and kind of cross-pollinated i like yeah. seeing you know a a chinese bride and a scottish groom at a wedding or something like that right. Right. it's fun marrying the cultures together um where i would say it could potentially get dangerous and i'll use the term dangerous is in in watering down things in becoming not really watering down but in becoming a caricature of the thing so in going to good. festivals and going to events and going just like like the lowest common denominator of, hey, I want to feel Scottish today, so I'm going to buy a $20 kilt or I'm going to wrap this tablecloth around me because it looks good. That's mm -hmm. where it gets dangerous for me because it's no longer celebrating the culture. It's a caricature of the culture so you can play at it for the day. And it's a fine line to walk. I, I think you've always had that. And I think other, other cultures, especially expressions of those cultures in this particular country have had a much worse time of it than 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 the Celts have frankly personal opinion there but but there's always going to be people who who look at the surface level and it's a cliche or a caricature or a stereotype um I think that people are more easily educated and that you're seeing more backlash against that these days I encounter more people you still have the party people who just want to like, oh, I'm going to be a Scotsman for Halloween and all Woo, that stuff. Woo, going to throw on my but, green plastic beads for yeah, St. Patrick's, Patrick's Day. Yeah, for Patrick's Day, exactly. Yep. But, but, you know, at the same time, I think you have more people who it's easier to, to tell people, okay, well, you know, you're kind of making fun of something that actually has a lot of depth and beauty to it if you look at it more closely. Um, and there's more pushback against the cliche people. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. yeah. But it's so. the same, but it's, it's a weird one because you don't want to discourage people who are just finding it for the first time. No. So if, no, they're, not. if their way to just dip their toe in the water, so to speak, is to go to a St. Patrick's Day parade and they have their green plastic bowler on that day, mm. you don't want them to feel bad for doing it, but you want to educate them and say like, hey, well, here's what maybe you could wear instead of that next year. Well, that, so it's it's the balance. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where we get it. I think the, the only answer to that is to lead by example, as, as we've said before. Basically, um, you're always going to have, you know, what my mom would call Philistines, um, you know, who, who don't really appreciate what they're doing. It's just, you know, they're doing the magpie thing. And, oh, it's shiny and cute and fun. And they're just going to pick it up and then drop it again. That's just human nature. Um, but, but if you can set a good example, then you can both maintain the compass point of tradition and also you know spread out uh bring them around yeah bring them around yeah so i remember when we started <clears throat> i just I, i'm gonna say things are getting better that's all i'm gonna say yeah no but things, it, are, things are getting a lot cooler if, especially if you look especially the music i'm glad we touched on that because yeah listen to some of the some of the uh folk uh shows like on on NP, uh, npr and stuff so the, the the music the folk music from all around has just gotten much more diverse and interesting and creative
Yeah, so. music is one place where I, I, I firmly believe that you don't need um, purity of a thing. Where blending different things together mm -hmm. is it just just to see what happens mm -hmm. makes it fun, makes it better, makes it more interesting, yeah. and it allows for a whole new thing to evolve out of it. Mm -hmm. Like Celtic rock wasn't a thing until the Pogues. Or, you know, Celtic punk wasn't a thing until Dropkick Murphys and, Fl and Flog and Molly and the Real Mackenzies. So it's it's fun to watch it evolve and for different flavors to kind of, it's kind of like food, you know, like mixing mm -hmm. it all together and see what works and see what doesn't. Yep. So, indeed. Yeah. yeah, it's, but walking, back to the other point, I think walking people up the scale of, you know, the, you know they're, they have to start somewhere. Everyone has to start somewhere. And if you start by jumping in and saying, okay, I'm going to spend, you know, $1,500 on an outfit. Great. Like, you're going to get good stuff, Whoa. I hope. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> or, but some people start with literally just, like, something cheap and, and like, wearing a, a, a costume for Halloween just because that's what they need for the guts to wear it out in public for the first right, time. Right. So you don't want to lambast them for wearing something that's offensive to you as somebody who enjoys the culture and da 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 but you want to encourage them to go further with it and maybe do something a little bit better right. next time right so i right. remember when we first started doing the uh the military targets strathmore one of the mills over in scotland was the is the only mill to do the the, the branches of the u.s military and i went to them and i said hey look i want to do military tartans in polyviscous fabric and they said well you know we you know because they don't do pv it's it's only martin mills it's only a different mill and so i'm asking them for tartans that they are the only ones who do to do it in a different fabric at a cheaper price point and they said well well why do you want to do that and i said well it people who are in the military can't necessarily afford a $300, $500, $600 kilt, mm -hmm. but they need to get into it. And we're not just saying, great, here you go, there's your kilt. See you in, you know, when you, you know, 20 years from now, 50 years from now. We're actively trying to walk people up the scale of quality. We're trying to educate people. We're trying to get them involved in the culture and want to support Scottish mills and that kind of stuff. So they kind of understood where we were going with it. So we actually got their permission to have the the military tartans woven in polyviscose fabric, and they have nothing to do with it. But we want people to start. We recognize that people need to start where they're comfortable spending their hard-earned money to get into it, and mm -hmm. at, at the at a particular you know price point level, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And eventually, over time, they're going to be like, you know what, I do like this. I do this, wear this more than once. I do want something a little bit nicer to wear to a formal dinner. So then let me get wool. And then they kind of move up the scale. So it's the education process. It's the moving process. It's yeah. not just, you know, letting them, letting people just do the, the cheap fun, you know, the cheap and cheerful, as they could say in Scotland, the cheap and cheerful route, but it's educating them along the way so that they understand, oh, okay, this is how... This is why they do things this way. This is how it should be done. Okay, this is actually the tradition, actually the heritage that I'm honoring. Maybe I should do this as well. Yeah. So, yeah. So again, to so the, the second part of his question, how how can you boost things? Be a good example and be and be supportive when people shows even a modicum of interest. You know, whether that's in your family, in your friend circle, whether it's your wife, your husband, whatever it is. Yes, bring them in. Like it, let yeah. them experience it with you. If you're already, if you're in the pool, you know, the answer is come on in. The water's fine. The answer is not stay out of there with that cheap BS acrylic kilt. How dare you get away? Don't come in here. The answer is it's a great place to start. Come on in. Let's do stuff together. Let's have fun with right. this. Let's experience this together. And then, you know, keep it yeah. moving forward. And ask them what their interests are. I mean, I, I always find, you know, I was like, Hey, cool! I can tell you're into this stuff. What are you most interested in? What do you want to learn about? Oh, yeah, me too. I like that. You know, so find meet them, meet people where they are. You yep. know. Also, it always works if you set up some speakers coming out of your basement windows and blast bagpipe music between 12 and 2 p.m. or 2 a.m. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like clockwork. So yeah. Can people like consistency. Like what's that. what's that meme? Yeah, my neighbor was banging on my door at two a.m. Luckily, I was up playing my bagpipes at the time. Yep. It's yep. The uh, no, but it's <laughs> you know it's it's meeting people where they're at. It's also taking the the bits of heritage that 
you enjoy, whether that's the music, whether that's Celtic festivals, whether that's clan tents, whether it's, you know, just your family stories, it's all of it. And just making sure you're passing it on to your kids, mm -hmm. make sure you're getting other people involved, making sure you're right. volunteering, making sure you're doing things to keep it moving forward. Share, share the, share the, share the culture, share what you're interested in, as long as you're not being pushy about it. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. All right. I think we've answered that one for yep. way too long. Yep. Mr. Mac. I'm going to edit the heck out of that. Well, before we get to the next question, um, do we have the results of our question of the month from last month? Oh, sure. Absolutely we do. This is Mac keeping us on track. It's a good thing I remembered that. All right. <clears throat> the question of the month last month was, what is your favorite toast? You know, cheers, kind of toast. So the top three answers in no particular order. Um, from MST8K on YouTube, just Salud is my favorite toast. <clears throat> Next is from Charles Bauer, who said, I don't drink for religious reasons, but my favorite toast is definitely French. I like it with maple syrup and powdered sugar. But don't. The dad in me loves that. Um, for the rest of you, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and... Uh, then from our good friend Sean Smith, he said, Favorite toast, may, uh, a man may kiss his wife goodbye, a rose may kiss the butterfly, wine may kiss the crystal glass, and you, my friend, may kiss my ass. Sean, colorful. I like it. So those are the favorite toasts of our audience. So share your culture with people, unless Indeed. you're Sean Smith. In which case, keep it to yourself and shut the hell up, Sean. <laughs> <clears throat> now, in fairness, he just wrote dot, dot, dot. I added the S. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm that lowbrow. Well, let the record show that Rocky added the S. <clears throat> exactly. All right, Mr. Mack. All right, so we have Robert asking, who is allowed to wear the standard doublet? I assume the military, military doublet is reserved for the military folks. Standard, oh, oh that's a product from our website. The, um, that's, that's that's a term we use to differentiate <coughs> from other things. Yeah, yeah. So. I'll answer it, but we're going to do another one real quick then. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, basically what happened was the uh, ten years ago now. Jesus, time flies. Um, we have there's a uh, company over in Scotland that makes our jackets, and they did a military doublet. They do it for the British military um, and for pipe bands and stuff like that. And it's like 550, 600 bucks, maybe even be more at this point. I have no idea. It's way too freaking expensive. Um, it's very, very, very good quality, but it costs a lot of money. And pipe bands, many pipe bands were coming to us saying, hey, we want a doublet. And I'd be like, hey, here's the military doublet. And then you'd be like, yeah, that's way too much money. So I basically, I went to the jacket manufacturer and said, all right, here's what I want to do. I want to make a doublet that looks as close to that as you can make, but cut, cut corners without co cutting too much quality. I want to pay about this because I want to charge people this. So make the best jacket you can within this price point. And they made what we now refer to as our standard doublet versus the military doublet. So that's the, the short and dirty answer for you. Um, it's essentially, there's like half the amount of braiding on the sleeves and the flaps on the bottom. There is no Russian braid around the neck. Um, and it's a lighter weight fabric, lighter weight interfacing. There's the, not the little hooks, there's less pockets, blah, blah, blah. That's that. Except the question was, who's allowed to wear it? Who's allowed to wear it? Anybody who Anybody. wears doublets. Yep. Okay. <laughs> did I misunderstand that entirely, Matt? Yes, you did. Oh, But okay. once that train starts, anyway. you can't put the brakes on. Sorry. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I made up the standard doublet for asking for something cheaper. <laughs> shut up. Shut up. It's like the shut business up. where he's like accessing data. <laughs> no, basically, military doublet just refers to the fact that it has um, military styling and is inspired by... Uh, military type garments going back to tunics from the 19th century, even the 18th century, um, which were worn by the military and then very quickly used by pipers attached to regiments, which then very quickly evolved into civilian pipers wearing military dress in order to look fancy wancy. So it is actually not a, there's no regulations about who can wear a military doublet or not. If you're thinking about wearing one for, for fun or something, it's a bit much. That's all I'm going to say. Yep. It's a bit much. It's going to come off as looking a, a bit costumey. Um, now, if you're looking for something that's kind of uniform-ish, <clears throat> sure. But I would I would rather encourage you to look at things like uh, the Montrose doublet or the Kenmore doublet. 
um, uh, things like that, that are, or, uh, sure, or yeah. the Sheriff Muir, which look freaking awesome and are more flexible in terms of how they are perceived. Okay? So. Agreed. That's the answer to that. Sorry. I went now, into. We answered that really fast. So, Matt, can we have another question, please? Yes. Well, uh, Kirk says your flag, so. Uh... Oh, dude, I'm nowhere near flag. <laughs> this is all caffeine and lack of sleep, buddy. <clears throat> I'm hearing what I want to hear, or uh, I'm listening to Mac, but I'm hearing me. So, uh, well, let's go to this question because this question has been a a high topic on the uh, in the the comments. Huh. Um, Jason is asking full beards, bow ties, and formal settings. Ties can ties can push my full beard a little, and it kind of looks weird. How bad would it look not seeing a tie f- from the side view? <clears throat> we totally don't have that question on this sheet. We totally don't have that question oh. on this piece of paper. <laughs> ask later on. Exactly. Um, yes. <laughs> You're going to cross it Jason Du Duggan. Mm-hmm. Wait, I have a vision. He's He wants to wear... A Brian Baru? A Brian I see Baru. a Brian Baru. I see a Brian Baru. Yes, and he has a beard. A, a long bearded beard. man. And he's, he's worried about it from the side. Yes. I appreciate okay. your tenacity, Jason. Well done. Um, the, um, my thought on it is this. So do you wear, if you have a long beard, should you wear a bow tie? Because it's essentially hidden by the beard. However, if you look from the side, you can see that you don't have it on. And you also, if you're wearing the, the, like the banded collar kind of thing mm-hmm. on the dress shirt, you don't see the, the black of the bow tie on the side. My thought is this. I would, I would still wear it so that it doesn't look weird in photos or from the side. However, I might look for a smaller bow tie. Oh, okay. They have Interesting. bow ties, believe it or not, come in different sizes. I've oh, seen yeah. smaller ones. I've seen like bigger, wider ones. I've seen smaller ones. So I would maybe look for a smaller bow tie so you at the least thought. see the band on the side around mm-hmm. the collar, mm-hmm. but you still have a – and it doesn't just – it just doesn't push it out as much in the front. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. I kind of dig that. Um, I appreciate I appreciate the problem. I think that it, it depends on how you trim the beard and how thick the beard is. Like if you got if you're doing a lot of layers, the neck beard. Yeah, well, but you know, it's a, <laughs> but if you're not if it, if it's not a neck beard, then it's layers. It's giving you fullness, you know, yeah. stuff. So um, that's an interesting idea. My thought was basically if you if the tie really bothers you, maybe opt for one of those shirts that you can wear like the decorative jewel thing in the top with you remember it's it's it used to be really trendy back in the in the 90s so i'm bolo, sure my age bolo but, tie no not a bolo tie <laughs> but the point is they used to have these tuxedo shirts that um or band collar shirts that would have a, a decorative button or a or pin here instead of a tie do you remember okay. that yeah yeah and yeah that yeah, would yeah. give you a closure because i think what the, the problem if you don't have the tie is not just that it looks like that but the the wing collar shirt is going to it's going to flare out it's going to boing out a little bit is this going to look weird? And it could be just as much of a problem getting caught in your beard as if you had the tie on anyway. So I would say you got to keep the shirt closed somehow. And it may be that a different style of shirt with some kind of other ornament, even if people aren't going to really see it much, um, could be another option. That's it. So you know essentially, I mean? like like the collar on your grandfather's shirt, like a banded sort of. collar like that. that yeah. just stands up at the top. Maybe. Um, yeah, yeah. It's That could work. Mm-hmm. I see that. I don't know if it's fashionable or out i'm not really up on not, my fashion yeah, what, so I'm, speak, what i'm describing but, really has not been in fashion for a while yeah but the thing there's also i remember the there's a, a tuxedo tie which i don't remember i don't know the name of but it's basically just two layers that go flip-flop over each other yeah yeah like, yeah yeah like that. um one of those it lays very flat that could be an option is that like a westerny kind of thing mac sort do you know of? what he's talking about am i i don't know i'm on, on the other shirt i'm just picturing like like being growing up in Southern Lancaster County, like the Mennonite, the old order Mennonites with the the little thin collars, like yeah. that's yeah. where I yeah. went right yeah. away with that. <clears throat> Only if it's a purple shirt, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, no, I'm picturing what he is like. It, it's a flat piece of. It's like an X yeah. right up at the right. neck. And right. For some it reason, was, I'm going like old timey, like cowboy it's a, western it's a, kind it's of a, thing. It was definitely a '50s thing. You know, like you see it in like um, doo wop and old R and B and uh, rockabilly looks. You know okay. I mean? yeah, 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 yeah. I'm picking like something Chuck like that. Berry or work. Something in it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, okay. yeah, I think I think that the goal is to make sure the collar is closed, so you have a, a smooth silhouette from the side, but it's also flat, so it's not interfering with your beard. Okay. So. Completely off the cuff. Take that thing, the X thing, you know, so it goes down the side, down the side, uh-huh. and then tie it around the beard, so it holds the beard flat against him. <laughs> Problem solved. 
Yeah, yeah, like a beard cravat. Yes. <sighs> no, you just shave the inside of the the inside of your beard. So it's, <laughs> it's like, like shave, shave it into shave, <laughs> into the shape of a bow tie. Of, exactly. I was gonna, oh, you're, you know, like I make a hole for yeah. the bow tie to <laughs> pop. <through. laughs> now I'm gonna go to the to the. Uh, I love that. To the 80s and 90s Philly commercial. It's mm-hmm. this may be a very very Philly thing. You know, Jerry's got a diamond in his beard. Lots of people oh, think man. that's really weird. weird. Rock and yep. Robins. Yep. 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 That is weird. Yes, indeed. I'm I was, sorry. The other option would be braids. Braid the beard. Full Viking. Yeah, go got full it. Viking. Got braid it. the beard, and then the tie will not be in, in the way of anything. It's all going to be nice, tight Viking slash dwarvish Yeah, braids. or maybe, maybe part the beard and go yeah. behind the bow tie. Yep. yep. Or do, like, the extreme beard competition thing and, like, sculpt the beard into, like, curly cues, you know. You or seen those, you seen that international beard competition? Yes, beards? Yeah. sculpt the beard into a bow tie. Mm-hmm. 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 This is very, very avant-garde at this point. What about like a like a skin do hilt shape or a claymore head? You see, like some beard coming out as the keons and then the blade of the sword coming down. Yeah. Nah, yeah. I don't know. No. Okay. Okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Good luck. I, I, I can't even give it. That's a good answer. Like, sorry for that answer. <laughs> it's an interesting. I think it's an interesting problem, and I can understand the comfort issue also. Because if you're going to be in that monkey suit, so to speak, for all day, it get really annoying. So understood. Agree. Yeah. yeah. Good luck. Just look for a smaller bow tie. I think that's probably the best. Nah, you all no fun anymore. Yeah, no. That's too right. easy. Fine. No, wait. So wait. That question was on my list. So then that doesn't oh, mean it's we have bar- one last it's time. It's Max' now. turn again, or no, it's my it's your turn. turn. It's my turn. Okay. All right. David Noble, the Noble David, uh, asked us, what does the industry, Highland Wear industry, I think, or you know, whatever, and related, need in your own personal opinions? I'm thinking of starting a small business, not looking to make kilts, mind you, or compete with you guys. <laughs> um, but do we need another American quality sporn maker or a high quality boot maker? Do we need someone to concentrate on, you know, what the Highland Games scene needs or something like that? Where, what are we lacking in terms of the material culture, the business side? Okay. What do we need? Yeah. Um, I could go a few different directions with it. Hmm. I will say there are, there, are, there are no mills in America. I wouldn't necessarily do a mill because <laughs> um, there's a whole lot that you need for the mill. If you're a one-man operation, let's assume he's a one-man operation. Yeah. Um, he is an early retirement guy who's an entrepreneur. Fair, fair. Um, I would, I would, all of my comments. I'm going to temper with follow your passion. If your passion is leather, then do something with leather. If your passion is Textiles, do something with textiles. If your passion is ribbons or making watches or whatever, follow what your passion is. It's the old, you know, if you love your job, you'll never work a day in your life. It's the, that mantra, especially in your retirement years. If you love what you do, you won't mind doing it. And you won't, <laughs> those 80 hours a week you're working will fly right by. <laughs> so start there, period. Now, um, for my opinion, what is the, what is the industry need? Um, uh, I would say this, more customization, more things hmm. that are okay. personal. So maybe personal sporins, um, like higher end sporins, perhaps, mm-hmm. um, more, uh, diced hose or argyle hose. They're kind of difficult to find, mm-hmm. um, leather, but leather, if you're going to do leather work, let's let's kind of break it down into categories. Yeah, you're reminding so, me of something. So keep if talking. you're leather work, then let's say, you know, belt, sporin, sporin chain, sporin strap, those kind of combos that work together. Um, or you could also do, you know, belt pouches and that kind of thing. If you're a knitter, then kilt hose or, th- or you know, or uh, uh, tams and things that can be knit, mm-hmm. that could work. Mm-hmm. Um, if you are trying to think what else... If your footwear, footwear is tricky because you end up, um, there's traditional Highland wear footwear, with, you know, like Gilly Brogues and, and Buckle Brogues and things like that that are already out there. There are companies that make Oxfords and things that you could use for shoes. And then there, the other kind of end of it is like, uh, like Catskill moccasins or like, you know, tall Renfair looking boots. 
-hmm. So it's yeah. kind of costumey, so to speak. Um, so it's footwear is a weird one to get into, but if you're into Renfair or reenactment and things like that, go full into it. If you love it, jump in with both feet. If you love leather working and the, the smell of leather and carving things out, great, go full into that. If you love the, the, the art of carving, meaning like images within it and not work on the leather, do that, specialize in that. If you're no good at carving, but you're good at working the leather, great, do that. You know, use a little, the little pre-made stamps for basket weave looking things, um, get into the braiding of leather. And you know, it's, there's, there's different niches within the niches that you can get into and just become an artisan of the craft. Okay, as opposed to trying to invent the next big thing, you're saying refine something that already exists. Yeah, or specialize. Yeah, okay. It's okay. where where I see things going as a macro thing, um, and and I was just talking to uh, uh, our spore maker Greg about this the other day. It was basically the the thing that they can't compete with as as artisans in their craft is mass production. So they're never going to compete with Pakistani spore makers for for cheap you know for cheap stuff. So if you want to really get in there and do something meaningful and really get uh, really get a ret an emotional return from your work and speak to individual customers, then I'd say get into an artisanal craft and do one-off individual things. Now, it's going to end up being more expensive because you have to value your time. And a lot of people don't do that properly. I'm mm. looking at Mac back there who makes reenactment stuff, who I've, you know, yelled at him several times of you're not charging enough for the thing you're making it's his own business but i can't help myself it's he's he's better than he gives himself credit for and he needs to charge more for the things because it takes so much time and effort so make sure you're valuing your own time as an artisan and get into the weeds on it i'd say specialize in something and do it well sorry i'm ranting now thoughts i have none okay no, I was trying to go the opposite direction. Like, was there something that like, is lacking that people say, oh, it'd be cool to have, but they don't. And I think it is more, it tends to be people want something specialized. In fact, I have a question related to that uh, on my list for today. Um, I do think hats is, is a weak point. Honestly, I think, I think, uh, I think um, it'd be interesting to see some different varieties of TAMs out there. Something that has a nod to a traditional, you know, Scottish TAM, but um, is, a, is a more modern cut if you will like a beret but not so much like a beret that looks like you're wearing a military beret you know what i mean i mean um yeah i don't know it's not going to look traditional but it doesn't necessarily no, but that's what i'm seeing I'm to trying to figure out. Yeah, yeah exactly mac do you have anything that you think i think sporn chains and sporn hangers that's an you, area you'd like to see more of less of um or I, the comments are actually loading up with some stuff on here so good because i ain't got nothing. like um like custom jewelry, bog shoes, um, mm -hmm. more of a uh, casual jacket made of yeah. like denim or suede, something yeah. that's not dressy like a tweed or, or an argyle. Mm -hmm. um, hats, headwear type stuff. They're they're saying so. It's you're getting all like the whole mix of things in the comments. Yeah, yeah. Oh, a denim doublet. <coughs> I just threw up my mouth with square buttons. <laughs> Make it no, purple. No, make it wait, purple. No, I think there's something to that. I mean, no, it's there's there's a way to make it all yes, to bring daily yeah. things into it. Um I I hesitate in in those kind of things from an aspect of if there if I can wear a Nike jacket or mm -hmm. a Dickies, you know, work jacket that's shorter cut and can work with a kilt, I wouldn't necessarily want to reinvent the wheel if there's something already there that fills that gap or is, is real close or close enough. Mm -hmm. But like, if we're gonna go into evolution of things, yeah, if filling a filling a need that is not there or a gap that is there that you don't see something already that exists, Mac is smiling, so he's got something up his one, sleeve. One thing that just that just came up on in the comments is something that we actually talked jokingly talked about um, going to the Flogging Molly show, okay. going through security checks and not having oh. <laughs> and not being able to take a sporn. Is. One of those clear acrylic, sporins. Acrylic yeah. clear spor sporin. A clear sporin. <laughs> a travel sporin. No. I, 
I didn't say this, guys. <laughs> but here's how you do it. Here's how you do it. If you're going to go to a concert, not that I would ever have done this, ever, twice, ever. <laughs> get a Sporin that is very, very, very simple. Has minimal, if any, metal on it. Just like the little metal snap on it. Get a Sporin strap. So it's just leather with a little tiny buckle on it. Put the strap, the, the buckle end, near the back of the Sporin. And then put the Sporin inside your kilt. Tuck it in there so that the metal all aligns with the buckle on the right-hand side. When you go through a security checkpoint, you just go, oh, it's just the buckles on the side of my kilt. They do the little wand thing. Half the time, they're too scared to actually fully pat you down. So you just walk in with your sporin tucked in the side. If you're not allowed to go to a place with, a, with the actual sporin or with a purse or that kind of thing. And then as soon as you get inside, pull it out, boom, put your phone in your can, your keys in there, you're good to go. I've never done that at a Flyers game twice this past season. It's never happened. <laughs> I've never done it at the Flogging Molly concert. It really, it never happened. Yeah, but clear vinyl sporin. It or hurts colored. me to actually think about it. As long as it's translucent, uh, yeah, you could make it. You could make it translucent plastic tartan, or or a color that's in your tartan. <laughs> you know, you're wearing Scott Red. You have a red plastic sporin with LEDs. There we go. You know, so you can see, so people see you at night when you're walking home drunk from the pub. It's just you know, lights up. You know. He was so it's like anxious. under it lighting. <laughs> he was so anxious to see if he could do a thing. He didn't stop and think, should, should he? we? Yes. Oh, yeah. Little... Or how about, how about LED lighting under the kilt so you have under lighting, like on a car? Well, I was going with the, like, you had like the, the rampant lion, like, like doing like, uh, you know, a roar. Actually, oh, that exists. Oh, really? There are bags <laughs> with LED screens that do different, does, do for different moves and mm -hmm. stuff. So, uh, yes, I'm... putting it on a sport, I actually did as a joke once here a few years ago for a show. I actually. Photoshopped a sporn with one of those LED picture screens on it, but you're saying make that a real thing. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. still stuck on the lights under the kilt, like ground effects from a car. <laughs> and I don't know. I don't want to know what you're going to suspend the lights from. It's well, from the inside him. Uh, a few inches up from the from. Uh, <laughs> what were you thinking? Yes, indeed. I oh, oh, it hurts my brain. I think different casual jackets is a good idea. I I honestly. don't I don't disagree. It's there there are ways. It's you know. It's not traditional, no, but yeah. you can still incorporate it into your daily wear, and we do that all the time. So I am I am full on to board the train of incorporating a kilt with a polo or with your, your normal everyday wear, just replacing pants or shorts with kilt. So you're paying homage to it, but you're not bastardizing it. Yeah. Um, and you're not making it a caricature, you're just incorporating it as part of yeah. your daily it's life. Clothes. Yes, yeah. it's part of your clothes. It's clothes with symbolism, but it's part of your clothes. Um, yeah. Except if you put ground effects under your kilt. <laughs> Indeed. Jamie, All right. I'm going to need a Photoshop of that. <sighs> yes. Oh. All right. You're not the only one who can ask for a request. <laughs> <clears throat> what okay. do we got next? Well, I think now it actually his. That was mine, so. Actually, actually okay. before actually. before we get to the next question, it's halfway through the show. Barrer. You know what that means. He means Our Kilt Ambassador this month is a bit more of a culture ambassador. He's someone you might recognize if you peruse YouTube on a regular basis. Sean is a Scottish vlogger, or a video blogger, if you will who's found his passion capturing life's journey through travel. Sean grew up in Edinburgh in a neighborhood called Stenhouse, known for its tough working class roots. And despite that reputation, he loved growing up there, right near the huge park, and found everyone he grew up with kind and friendly. His journey to become a Scottish YouTuber started in 2014. Sean was traveling to Brazil, where his wife Tech is from, and he wanted to document the trip to show people what life was like in Brazil. A journalist by trade, Sean fell in love with the process of documenting his travels, and he hasn't looked back since. In his own words, I enjoy the exciting discomfort of going somewhere unfamiliar, meeting people from diverse and different backgrounds, the thrill of discovering different things in a new country, plus connecting the dots as to the similarities that I find around the world. I asked Sean if he considered himself more of an ambassador of Scots to the world or a teacher for Scottish people on the places that he visits. Or is that way too serious of a take of what he does? He said, maybe that's a bit too serious, but I guess it's a bit of both. 
My main aim is to try to spread positivity wherever I go. On my recent U.S. road trips, I focused on the positive things I've come across and the many truly amazing people that I meet, as well as injecting a bit of my own brand of Scottish charm. I definitely try to act as a bit of an ambassador. We chatted for a bit about his clan and his family tartan, and he gave me a very interesting answer. Quote, I have absolutely no idea. The majority of people in Scotland don't really know this either. At least none of my friends and family in Edinburgh do. My brother did some digging, and the furthest back he could trace was around the First World War. For most people in Scotland, tartan and kilts are more of a symbol of our pride in our progressive and talented nation rather than any family affiliation. Of course, there are people who have this clan connection, but the vast majority of folks simply don't. We are Scottish, the end. And tartan is one of our symbols of national unity. Sean's been a lot of places around the world, and he recorded most of them. We asked him to give us his top three travel destinations. In no particular order, Iceland has to be up there. Go there when it's snowy and icy with the northern lights out. The place is otherworldly. For food, New Orleans is the top destination. It's so unique and diverse, I loved it there. Then, for good big city vibes, New York. If you think you're adventurous or ambitious in any way, you have to test your mental strength by living there for a time in the Big Apple. The energy is electrifying and contagious. Sean has recently begun to focus his YouTube channel a bit more on his American travels, rebranding his channel Sean in America. Sean is a positive, kind, curious person with an excitement for traveling. For those who haven't seen his content, please go check out his YouTube channel or find him on Facebook, Instagram, or even TikTok. He has a truly unique way of showing you a location through the eyes of someone experience it with wonder for the first time. So here's to him. Sean, our ambassador of the month. Got it. So. so here's to Sean. He is a wonderful, wonderful human. Cheers. Cheers. Um, yeah. What's your, what is your favorite place? Speaking of Sean, speaking of world travel, what is your favorite place you've ever been? In the world. My living room. <laughs> <laughs> my bed. Wait, my, my favorite place? That you've For ever any reason to? at all? Or that yeah. I travel to? Yeah. Because it's not Scotland. It's not in Scotland. I... It's it's my house in Arizona. Okay. My 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 family homestead is in Sedona, Arizona. Red okay. Rock country. So my favorite place in the world is a little tiny uh, trail off into the uh, off of Oak Creek Canyon uh, in Sedona. Okay. Nobody knows about that place except me and my sisters. That's my favorite place. <laughs> Fair. Just about. Well, if there are a few other people, you know, but it's 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 our place. Yeah. The thing that's the thing is like it, it feels like your place. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a trail out there where I proposed <clears throat> to my wife, which is also a favorite place of mine. So that is lovely. So yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. The I would say mine. Not that you've asked, but I'll answer it anyway. Mine. I usually don't have to bother. You're a very empowered person. <laughs> um, the uh, I'd say the place that like weirdly without it like snuck up on me um, and left the biggest imprint was the first time I was in Scotland and we went to uh, uh, we drove Lock or Lockard and then we tra we drove for the day through the you know the little valleys and hills and valleys over to Calendar and mm -hmm. on the way back we stopped at this little. Uh, like car park between two I'm really mountains, but huge hills, um, like winding okay. road. And there was a place to park, you know, some grills and just hang out and do nothing. And it, the sun was going down. So my, my wife and I stopped there and just kind of watched what was happening, you know, the sun going down and there was no other cars on the road. And it was like deathly quiet. Like it was like, mm -hmm. like soundproof room quiet. Like yep. you could hear the blood coursing in your veins kind of quiet. And I don't know why, but it was it was one of those. It left the, it left an impression on me of just like dead silence, and it was just so weird and not eerie weird, but like calming weird. It was so, just like wow. So this is like, really cool. and then I went mad. Yes. <laughs> and that's the, where I buried the my, of my heart. <laughs> um, no, I, I, there's a lot to be said for solitude. I mean, that's why I yeah. like the desert that out, out west. It's just like because, yep. as my uncle puts it, there's miles and miles of miles and miles. And uh, you can, if, you <laughs> I like want, that. if you want to get lost out there, you can get lost in, in a good way. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for that, especially if you live on the east coast of the United States like we do. So it's so built up around here. Agreed. But, 
Yeah. So is that your question next, or is that Max? Uh, I forget who I was throwing to. It should be going to Mac next, I think. Mr. Mac, what do we have next? Mr. Mac, Mr. Mac. All right, so we have Dave asking, how would you suggest a larger man wear a dress sporn to a formal event when chains undercut the belly mm. and candles clang on belt buckles? Mm. Yep. It is a... It is a common problem I know nothing about, um, where you have a little bit of a belly in the front, and you know yeah. basically it sticks out past the front of your legs. So when you wear a dress sporn, it kind of gets tucked up underneath it like you. It hangs at an angle. Yeah, or yeah. it hangs at an angle back, exactly. Yeah. So there, there, there's two options. One, you can wear a sporn chain, or check that, sporn hangers. So, but with sporn hangers, you have to wear a belt. A sporn hangers are basically the little, the little uh, key fobs that, like, when you have a biker wallet, they they snap over your belt and you hang your your chain or your your keys from your belt. Yeah, you can buy two of those things. They're available on any kilt website, um, and you can hang your dress sporn or hang your sporn from those from your belt. The problem is twofold. One. <clears throat> The weight of the sporn is suspended by the belt, so you have to make sure your belt is on and snug, or else mm -hmm. what ends up happening is mm -hmm. your belt just dips down in the front and you look disheveled. Second problem is, a dress sporn, the cantle, the metal, the bit at the top with a little knob on the top, ends up banging into your belt buckle. And when you sit down, it really bangs into the belt buckle. So it's not, definitely not an ideal solution. So the, the hack that I've learned over time is, if you wear your uh, uh, your sporn chain up a little high, hook your sporn chain over the top of your buckles on the sides of your kilt, your waist strap, your waist buckles on the sides of your kilt. When you're wearing a dress sporn, when you're wearing a, a vest or a waistcoat, you're typically not wearing a belt. Because you're not wearing a belt, you don't have to worry about it banging into, you know, the, the, the buckle and the, the top of the cantle banging into each other. Mm -hmm. So... If you wear your sporn chain lower like you normally do, it kind of underlines the belly. The way to stop that from happening is you wrap it over, hook it over the top of your sporn chain or your, your belt buckles on the side. That way it's not hanging real down and low and swooping down the front. It's up higher and it hangs down at a steeper angle. So you can wear your sporn a little bit higher on the belly and it tends not to kind of underline the belly and give that disheveled look. And the worst time is when you are sitting down, then you go to stand back up, and you have the whole, you know, the front of your kilt's kind of like puffing out above the top of the sporin. Right. You know, so if you wear the sporin chain up higher, that tends not to happen nearly as much. There you go. Any now, thoughts from you? Uh, only one question. Would that work as well using a sporin <clears throat> strap as opposed to a sporin chain? Yeah. Or is the chain better? Yeah, sporin... Spore and chain might be a, a little bit better for it because the chain can, you know, travel any direction and not be <clears throat> stiff like a spore and strap could be. But you can definitely do that with a spore and strap as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I personally think that uh, if it works for you, um, a hack like Rocky is describing, I think, just tends to look better. I don't really like the look of spore and hangers. They look kind of technical, for lack of a better term. Um, they're not very elegant. Um, now, some guys find those to be definitely the superior solution, and I have known one or two people who will, they'll wear a, a, a skinny belt, hear me out, a skinny belt or um, like one of those uh, skinny belts like a, the Dickies belt that has a no buckle, it just like hooks and it, all you see is yep, the leather, yep. um, or wear the buckle off to the side and they'll use the sporn hangers, but they're always wearing a layer on top of that because if you saw that belt, it would look stupid. Um, so a, a thin belt to, to hold the hangers and not have the buckle as a problem at all and just have as minimal material as possible to hold up the hangers could be another way to go. But it only works if you've got a vest or a sweater on. Otherwise, it's going to look stupid. Agreed. Whereas your hack basically will look good even if you take your vest or sweater off. Yep. So, yeah. Agreed. Hope that helps. I guess the other, the, other, the other final thing, though, is oh. remember you don't have to wear a sporn. Some gentlemen will actually, I know, it's traditional, and, yeah. and it's one of the differentiators for making sure that you are definitely in Scottish gear, but technically, you don't have to wear a sporn. If you have to go without, because otherwise it's going to be dragging on your body, and things are going to start to slide down or something because of your body shape, 
then uh, you do not. <coughs> you, uh, bottom line is you don't have to wear a sporn. For formal. Well, for formal, yeah. That's what he's talking okay. about. Well, all right, all right. I, I forgot that conveniently. Didn't 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 someone? I won't point to anyone in particular. Give me crap, Mac. A few questions ago for not listening to the question and answering a different question. Just checking. Okay. No one in particular. What? Okay. Um, now, for, for formal, even it's... For, even for formal, I'd say. If, if it's going to look horrible, but it's... Some, sometimes form has to follow function. I agree. But it's to me, it doesn't... It, it, it completes the outfit. I agree. So I'd rather do suggestion A or B and not have to go without okay whatever you do do not wear it around your neck like a flavor flavor clock indeed there's sporing up here boy i don't think that would work no okay all right mr eric now it's my next? turn yes all right okay justin c mcdonald um I've long been the only member of my family interested in clan heritage, wearing my McDonald dress scarf since I was a teen. So he got into that even before he got into kilt. Thanks. As I gear up for my wedding in a Prince Charlie, my family is now expressing a desire to add tartan to their outfits. We've talked a lot about the kilts, but what are some gateway options <coughs> for the women? So everybody wants to get into some tartan. They have no experience. I'm going to get into some tartan for the wedding, but... Okay. They're going to do kilts for the guys, but what are the women? What are the options for the women? It says, P.S. While watching one of your episodes, my bride said, Your next kilt is coming from them. Nice. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, thank Justin's you. fiance. Yes. Thank you for forcing very, him very to do Very kind that. of you. <clears throat> Checks in the mail. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so, are we, we're specifically saying women, or because he said his family? We don't know if it's men or women. Um, he says they've discussed kilts, but the main concern apparently is what are the okay. what are the options for the women. He uses the term gateway, so I'm thinking he's trying. To, he's hoping for something, some simple ideas that are not going to be intimidating. Agreed. Let's let's do let's let's. But we can cover the whole thing. We can yeah, cover that's both. what I was going to say. Let's so just for posterity. Yeah. So if somebody needs something for guys, they can do it as well. Yeah. <clears throat> for a wedding, for men, I would say th uh, three of them come to mind for how to, if your groomsmen, family or not, decide like, nope, 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 they're, they're throwing a, 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 you know, a fit, they're not gonna wear kilts. Um, but you want to incorporate a bit of tartan into the ceremony for them. There's a few different ways you can do it. One, tartan vests. Two, tartan tie or tartan bow tie, potentially. Mm -hmm. Three, pocket square. Mm -hmm. uh, another one that I don't know if I've said before is maybe a piece of cloth either tied to or under the boutonniere. I don't remember you mentioning it before, but yeah, yeah, that was a classic. So that would be mine for men. What are you? Do you have any thoughts on male? No, I personally don't care for the tartan vests. Um, sometimes they look cool. Sometimes you look like a waiter on a cruise ship. So I'd be very careful with that. Um, but I think you covered it nicely. Okay. Yeah. So moving on, women. What do we want to have for? women for incorporating them into a ceremony but they're not you know full on tartan ball gowns everything's going to depend on the formality of the occasion i mean if you're talking about a beach wedding then you don't have to worry about any of this if you're talking about a a serious wedding that's going to last three hours with an incorporated mass in the cathedral in the capital city then you're probably going to go a little more formal um it's it's a daytime thing also like are, is it daytime wedding or an after six wedding most weddings are daytime these days yeah um that being said um the very very simplest thing like you were alluding to um would be uh some tartan mixed into a corsage yep okay um that's that starting small um tartan accents uh, sash is probably the next most obvious option because you can wear it a variety of different ways with a variety of different kinds of dresses or outfits um yeah those are the those are the easiest <coughs> and also the frankly the most economical uh, things you can do and then moving on up the scale a, uh, a kilted skirt if they've got the scratch um, traditional kilted skirt or better yet if it's more formal a hostess skirt which means the length goes down to the ankle with a traditional blouse you know basically the, the whole timeless thing uh, blouse and perhaps a bolero jacket something like that can look very sharp so you have like I can I can easily imagine like a hostess skirt blouse bolero jacket and a tartan 
tartan corsage just like the, mm -hmm. the, the men in the groom's party could actually look really sharp. So, I would also say a shawl or a wrap of some kind yep. could work, yep. um, depending on, you know, again, what kind of dress the ladies are wearing. Um, I would also, if they're not that into it and don't want tartan as the symbolism, perhaps some jewelry, um, a brooch or a, a yeah. necklace or earrings or something tonal, like that. The tonal. Correct. Well, yeah. Tonal. Yep. Um, the, Coordinate. yeah, or a rosette. A, a small tartan rosette. Yep. Um, just little tiny accents. It doesn't have to be an over-the-top thing. You're just trying to impart some level of symbolism that, hey, they're involved in the thing. That's mm -hmm. why they all have the same tartan on or whatever. Yeah. So. Yeah. I would say, uh, yeah, and rosette was kind of, I was fishing for that word, and for some reason I was losing it. But, yeah, rosette typically going with the sash um, is another easy option and, you know, spices it up a little bit. Um, you can incorporate things like clan symbolism in jewelry as well uh look and booth jewelry uh traditional scottish um symbol of matrimony and love so that's a, that's an easy one you could you could use and frankly look and booth pieces of jewelry can be a nice gift for the members of the bridal party also if you need to give them some kind of token for their participation that's that's a nice option i have another one he's got another one yes um potential not for everybody but you could also give this as a gift to the bridal party, mm -hmm. matching neck tattoos. Oh, okay. For all the women. I was gonna go with clan crest. I was gonna go with tights. You know, like no, tartan, no, no. Tartan neck tattoos. Yeah. Okay. Neck tattoos. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or, or, so I'm gonna go or with brands it. of the clan crest. You know, like, you know. Maybe not on the neck, but yeah. <laughs> I think it, it, it's kind of what I'm not hearing from the question. Also, is what does your bride to be want the vision of the wedding to be? Because um, some folks are very, very strict about what they want for the colors and the forms of the special day. Others are more freeform. Um, if you look at weddings in Scotland or less formal weddings here, you'll see a rainbow of tartan. Um, people do not all necessarily have to match. Uh, and then it goes up from there, like that you might have a different tartan for each side of the family. You know, like the, the, you know, the bride has a tartan that represents their family. and. Uh, the groom likewise and you have two tartans and then they get combined for instance in a hand fastening cord something like that or you have the the exact modern everything is monochrome and gray and silver and black super modern ultra sleek you know new york tartan wedding um and everybody's in sterling gray and that's it so you need to make sure you have a unified vision of what the vision is and and your bride-to-be needs to be the leader of that at least traditionally, Involved that is in the, the process. Yeah. yeah, I mean, my wife and I shared our ideas equally, and we we had, luckily we had very similar aesthetics in mind, um, so it wasn't a problem. But um, that's the thing: um, leave some room for creativity, and and make sure that it's not going to be an economic burden. I will say this: a tartan skirt. I think a lot of women would much rather have a requirement that they have and purchase a tartan skirt for a wedding, rather than a bridesmaid's dress which they're going to wear once and it's going to sit in the freaking closet and maybe they try to make it work for an evening dinner at one point and then you know it doesn't fit anymore and they get pissed off that they had to spend all this money on it. and jamie's over here smiling because she knows exactly what i'm talking about um so in that sense you could actually be doing your bridal party a favor by saying invest in a garment that you're going to get more use out of and enjoy more and we'll always remind you of the day how's that lovely and Matching neck, ta neck tattoos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm going. Yeah. Or piercings. Piercings work. Yeah. Septum. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Septum piercings. Oh, and then you can run a chain wedding. between them for the ceremony. No. You know. The minister pierces you at the altar mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. puts the chain between them and yanks it down so you have to force them yeah. to kiss. Bonk. Exactly. Either kiss or headbutt. It's, a it's an omen. Brand new ceremony. Yes. <laughs> sounds don't very, do it. Sounds do very this. Klingon. Don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Don't do any of that. Enjoy your wedding. Yeah, All good right. luck. <laughs> Mr. Mac, what do we got next? Well, we've had... He's just giving up. <laughs> no, no th 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 we've had a lot of uh, questions today in the <laughs> what feed. What the hell are they doing? What the hell are they on? Yeah. <laughs> that uh, have been questioning of brown and black leather. Mm. About mixing them, about uh, is that a do or a don't, is the... Um, um, what tartans go do certain tartans go better with 
mm. with blue or with black or brown leather. So it's black and blue. So it, it's the the question is black and yellow, black and yellow. Wait, I hate the Steelers. Yes. <laughs> um, for for <coughs> brown and black leather, is there should the, one be in one lane, one be in another lane? Can they cross paths? Gotcha. Sure. That's a classic question which we have not been asked in a while. So yeah, thank you. Um, the there's the American matchy matchy answer, and then there's the Scottish answer, and then there's everything in between. And there's our answer. Yeah. <laughs> the um, uh, the American matchy matchy answer is leathers should match. Period. End of. The uh, so if you're wearing a black sporn, you should also have a black belt and black shoes. Don't ever mix leathers. Um, the Scottish answer is eh, it's fine. <laughs> the uh, so they would mix leather colors. You wouldn't have to necessarily have a black belt, you know, a black belt and a brown sporn would be okay together. Um, and keep in mind with brown, there's tan, there's chocolate brown, there's dark, 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 dark chocolate brown, there's all kinds of different ox levels blood. of brown. Yeah, yeah, there's ox blood, yeah. there's everything in between. Mm -hmm. So it's it gets a bit tricky. What we, what we did way back when um, was we started introducing things, sporins and belts or whatever, that had brown and black mixed together. So that way, if you wanted to wear a brown sporin or a, a, a black belt or a brown belt with a particular sporin, like something like this, um, that has brown and you know black laser etching, um, you can kind of mix it and it's it doesn't look as odd. Or if you wanted to wear brown shoes and a black belt, wear a sporin like this and you kind of split the difference. Yeah. So again, there's... It's it's as creative or non-creative as you want to be. It's how comfortable are you as a matchy matchy individual versus a eh, throw it on and see what happens kind of individual. And I would caution a little bit the the throw it on and see what happens. You there are some people who can just make things work and things work for them and they know how to put an outfit together and others that know less how to put an outfit together. I'll try to say it politely. Um, so. Yeah, it's your mileage may vary. We I think we've said this before in the past. If you if you really have no idea, ask a couple of people's opinions. Go up to the you know the Kilts and Culture Facebook group and say, Hey guys, here's a picture of me in this this shirt, this belt, this sporin, these shoes. Do you guys think it works or not? You're not gonna hurt my feelings. Please tell me the truth. Give me a scale of one to ten, and people don't yell at people for saying they don't like it. It's okay. I want real feedback, and you know, ask for real feedback. If you're not sure and you want to check it for yourself, and you kind of want to live with the idea, take a picture of it and put it as your your homepage on your phone for a week, and just keep looking at it every time you open your phone. And your, what's your gut reaction? Is it good? Or after three days, do you go, oh, what the heck was I thinking? And then you just say, no, nope, okay, I'm not going to do that. So there's different ways to kind of hack at it to see if you like an outfit or you think and you feel it works over time. Yeah, I can't really improve on that answer. I mean, I can usually improve on your answers now. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I think if you're not sure, stick with black is, is, is another thing, especially if you're doing most of your purchasing online, it can be tricky. Um, as, as good as we try to make photography on our website, your computer might be different a different seller or a seller on a mixed site like Amazon or someplace is going to have di or you different don't, manufacturers. Yeah, you yep. don't know what the what the level of, of you don't always know exactly what you're seeing, and I think browns are incredibly tricky, um, ridiculously so. I would veer towards darker browns whenever possible, and I would I do think the two tone thing is a very good way to go. It's worked really well, um, and obviously the more casual you're being about this stuff, the less of a concern it is. Yeah. Um, you're not going to be wearing brown for anything that's after six, in my opinion, uh, anyway. You know, I generally, yeah. Generally. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I would almost rather, like, if you really want some brown in an outfit, go with a black leather, but a brown fur or something like that, or a brown pelt on, yeah. like, a hunting sporn. You yeah. know what I mean? <clears throat> Play with it that way. And you, you kind of, you, you hit the nail on the head. Brown leathers, trying to match brown leathers from different manufacturers oh, it's evil. is a friggin' nightmare. Mm -hmm. We literally, and uh, <laughs> the, the, the number of companies that do brown ghillie brogues that we like was one. So we, <laughs> I sent a pair of brown ghillie brogues to our spore manufacturer and said, hey, Greg, I need you to match this brown. 
and he sent me a couple different samples of colors and none of them were close enough for me. So I said, he basically said, okay, well we can, we can dye brown to match. And I said, okay, great, fine, do that. So we have brown belts and brown sporin tan, I should say tan, um, to match the shoes because anything else was just not a good enough match for people who would be matchy matchy about it. Yeah. Um, but if you buy your shoes from this company on Amazon and you buy your sporn from that kilt maker and you buy your belt from that guy over there at the, at the Ren Fair, it's, it's not necessarily going to be a good match. And as someone who is anal retentive about many, many things in my life, I am telling you, it's difficult to do. And we try our best to get it as close as possible. Mm -hmm. For the record, don't buy stuff at the Ren Fair. Yeah, no, 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 because there are there well, are okay, good artisanal can. workers just, at the Ren Fair. There I've are been craft burned. people. I know people have been burned. There are yeah, a lot of leather just, workers at Ren Fair. There are right. jewelry right. companies there are at some Ren Fair. Gorgeous sworn makers out yes. there. You're absolutely right. It's, but again, you're but but there you you are at least seeing it in person again. Yes, you but don't I mean? buy the 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 cheap stuff. It's generally if it's cheap, there's a reason it's cheap. Yeah. 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 I would say I'll I'll give another maybe another possible hack is. If you're thinking about shoes versus sporn, um, it's, you're going to be better off if the shoes are a darker color than the sporn, as opposed to the reverse. Like I was, I'm looking in the in the monitor and I'm looking at our targe back here, and I can imagine like shoes in that dark brown and a sporn in the mixed browns of the of the decorations that could actually look pretty freaking awesome. Mm -hmm. So there are ways to play with it, and I think that brown will improve with weathering. Um, the longer you have it, and the more you get you know body oils into it and stuff like that the or more it's gonna look good oil, yeah yeah or yeah or in, yep. in, intentionally try to weather it a little bit to darken it could help with the process yep um i tend to prefer the redder or darker browns than the tan i think they're more forgiving so personally ish like, I'm, I'm no offense but i've never really liked that that color very much that thicker tan yeah oh sorry the vapors yeah no it's it's fine i that's <laughs> That's a nice color. Understood. But like when it comes to like oxblood or like the, love the ox red, blood. see, I can't stand it. Gotta if I'm going to do red, I'm going to do bread. I'm not going to do plum. I'm not going to do purple. Nah. Do purple nah, leather. Nah. 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 I'm going to do freaking cherry red. If I'm going to do docks or I'm going to do a tannish brown. I, you I think wear like, cherry red docks? I, that was my first pair of Doc Martens. Really? It was a pair of cherry red docks. That's Eight cool. holes. Yep. Nice. Um, nice. But the, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. but then I started calling them oxblood and I'm realizing, no, oxblood is a different color. Um, yes. It just sounds more badass. Ox blood, yeah. <laughs> and everybody else at the show mocked you. It's like, he thinks his boots are ox blood. Uh, uh, uh. They're cherry. Yeah. Red fruit. <laughs> Red exactly. Fruit. Red fruit. <laughs> Red okay. fruit. Yes. All right. So, anyway, did we answer the question or not? Yeah, I have what no about idea. The, what about the tartans as far as is there oh, right. certain tartans that go better Weathered often. With, with browns or certain tartans that go better with black? Go ahead, because I'm going to disagree with your answer. I want, to, I want you to go first so I can disagree with you. My answer is Paisley. If you're going to I'll very much disagree with you. If you're going to disagree with me, I might as well go all in, right? Yeah. Um, no, I don't know. I think, honestly, it doesn't bother me that much. I think any tartan can look fine yeah. with either of them. Um, if you're going for, like, I mean, we're heading into fall, <clears throat> so it's, it is getting to be tweed season. Um, I think that weather tartans uh, can look very nice with brown leathers. Um, and some of the uh, the muted tartans, especially, can look really nice with browns. So, yeah, that's that's my general answer. But it's it depends on the tartan. It's very idiosyncratic. Yes, I I will actually go. I'll still disagree a little bit. Um, brown, I'm I don't know. See, it, from my matchy matchy standpoint, I don't know if I like brown. Depends on the brown with the tartan. If it's mm -hmm. a weathered tartan, because if it doesn't. Right go if it doesn't match the brown does it feel like you you took your shot and missed versus you're just doing something mm -hmm. so like i love like brown and navy think like you know regular saxon wear suits brown and navy are a classic combo that's why i'm wearing my you know tannish brown sporin today with a navy vest yeah. and navy in the kilt like i said because you guys in a suit with that exact combo but those are the shoes correct yeah the so i like brown and navy together i so a modern tartan would not look bad with brown at all um yeah. ancients don't look brown brown bad with brown it really depends on the whole outfit versus you know what your any particular yeah. individual thing it and can it, it can all work it, it all doesn't work the kind of the the leathers and the tartan are are two separate entities so right. they'll work together period mm -hmm. 
yeah, we always say that the 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 sporn stands alone. It is definitely always almost always a centerpiece of the outfit, um, but it kind of stands on its own. Like uh, people sometimes ask us, like, is there one fur you should have on your dress sporn versus another because of the colors in your tartan? And the answer is no. Also, yes, all Just, of them. If you like it, wear it. The sporn is its own thing. Um, I but it's kind of a chicken and egg thing for some guys. Like you know, do you get the tartan before you get the kilt or get the the sporn, or do you, do you pick out the brown sporn because you know it's going to go with a particular tartan you own? You See, know, it's, but it's it, not a chicken and egg thing because it's it's chicken and and chair. It's it, they're both fine. The chicken sitting on the chair. Yeah. Um. You it does Forgot. it doesn't matter the tartan. It doesn't matter the sporn. They all go together. Yeah. Period. Um. To your point, some people do say like. Oh, I was gonna get this sporn, but it's a br- for a dress mm-hmm. as a dress sporn, but it's brown fur, yep. and you really shouldn't yep. wear brown for formal. Well, That's the true. sporn doesn't matter. It's fur. It's freaking fancy, dude. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it doesn't have to be black musquash. You can wear a brown fox sporn. You can wear a, a brown musquash. You can mm-hmm. wear a brown rabbit. Yeah. It's all fine. Yep. Yes, all that. There you go. In a bag of chips. Oh, was that I'm you hungry. or Mac? No, I'm hungry. That was, uh, that was Mac. So, okay. So, you. You in the hat. Hello, folks. Um, all right. Totally different totally different area of, of speculation now. Uh, Jared Bruce, or Bruce, uh, asked us, what is the best brand or variety of scotch whiskey to give as a gift to someone who is not an experienced whiskey taster? How about for an enthusiastic but novice taster? What whiskey is a good gift for your boss? Um, basically, you know. Or for me, you can give me whiskey too. Um, how it's it's a very good question. <clears throat> yeah. How, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you introduce um, people to Scotch without them going? Ah. I, I would say this. You you want to price point wise, I would stick sixty bucks or under. So you don't want to go crazy on something that somebody is going to go, mm, thanks, I'll, I'll pour this out later. Um, or you don't want to go too cheap where it's just going to be bad. Um, so I would say Glen Kinchy is a good one. Okay. Um, what was the what was the other one that I really, really liked? The Space Side that we had. Um, I had it in my office. Now it, the name is escaping me now. Darn it. Um, damn it. Uh, we'll know. have to use the Wayback Machine yes, later. Yes, exactly. I don't Insert it remembers, so. here. Um, the uh, it was a customer who gave it to us for you know for a gift, and we did a thing on the show. We weren't gonna. It was the first one we that reviewed. Doesn't help. It was the first one we reviewed that somebody gave us, and I'm like, oh, oh okay. I'm not sure if I'm gonna like it. And then we drank it, and I'm like, oh, it's really really good. We got to review this in the show. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Anyway, so I would say Glen Kinchy is, but Glen Kinchy is a very very solid one. I would not necessarily do an Isla or something with a very, very, very strong pr- flavor profile. Yeah. Because that could put them off to the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And if they've never had it, or if they're like, yeah, I've had scotch, I wasn't, mm, I was kind of okay on it. Then I would say, give it to them with a piece of chocolate. So get a, a medium to blandy kind of scotch and give them a small piece of either milk or dark chocolate and tell them, okay, put the chocolate in your mouth and let it kind of melt in your mouth for a few minutes, or not, you know, 15, 20 seconds. You know, and, and kind of swim the chocolate around in your mouth. Don't swallow it, just put it in your mouth and let it kind of sit there. And then take a sip of scotch with the chocolate. And if you've never done that before, try that as well. It, when Bill Reed was here, he had us doing that, and I'm like, wow, yeah. that's really, really cool. It's interesting. It gives it a whole different, like, profile. Mm-hmm. So if somebody doesn't like scotch, that is his, Bill Reed's trick to making them kind of start to appreciate it is give them a little bit of chocolate with it. So, so Glen Kinchy with a bit of chocolate. That's so just my a answer. spoonful of chocolate helps the medicine go down. Exactly. And scotch yeah. is medicine. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. I, 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 would, I would argue that you could just, if you're making an evening of it, um, have like three. Okay. And, and I mean, he's talking about gifts, but you know, if I'm imagining this in person at the moment, but you have like two or three for the evening and you have a, like a charcuterie board and and chocolate, so you have some fruits, you have some cheeses, and you have the chocolate, so that you can they can they can experiment with pairing things based on what their personal preferences are. Give them a few options to help them ease themselves into it, and make sure you have some water so that they can you know rinse. Yeah, little tip. Yep. Or uh, open up yeah. the scotch as well. That too. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe 
and if you're going to do that with somebody as well, give them, you know, the scotch neat and then give it, you know, maybe have two. One that's neat and one with a couple drops of water mm -hmm. to help open it up and then explain the differences and see how this one neat tastes a little bit this different than this one with a little bit of water. And they may gravitate towards one or the other, but give them some options and explain it to them. Yeah, and I think explaining it to them is, is a good thing. Like, if it's, a, if it's a gift for somebody who you're not in person giving it to, make sure you write some of these notes down for them. Say, hey, I know this is your first time trying this. I hope you really enjoy it. Enjoy a special evening with it. Here are my suggestions on how to do it so that they aren't going into it blind. You know? Yeah. And give them a deadline. Exactly. I want a report I back. I want a full report. I want a full report in three <laughs> days. Exactly. A book report on it. Yep, exactly. <laughs> All right, Mr. Mack. Now, do you only put the red fruits on that, that charcuterie <laughs> board? Exactly. Yes. No, if, if yes. you're going to make it a gift like that, I would say give them a little bar of chocolate. Maybe find what sure. foods pair well with it, what cheeses, whatever. Mm -hmm. Give them a couple pieces of cheese. Give them a, the bottle of scotch and make a yeah. make a little bit of a thing out of it. Yeah. But I agree. Definitely not something too too peaty. Yeah. Or too peaty, too Not smoky. too overpowering. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. All right. Mr. Mack. All righty. So we have with mouse work. There we go. All right. Shield egg. That Shield egg Shield is the egg. name of the damn scotch. I forgot. Shield egg. Bam. Knew it was going to come back. Thank God I got that before Mac <laughs> opened his mouth to ask the next question. Yes. Shield egg. So we, we could edit that in as if you didn't. We could just add out all the things. Just like, just the, like, the, the angry expression. Shield egg. That's when I say insert here. Put it there. It's fine. Right. <laughs> all right, Mac. All right. What do we got next? <laughs> that might frighten the audience. <laughs> we have Rob uh, asking. Sir Sean Connery was often seen wearing a black turtleneck with his PC, uh. and he thought it looked really cool. Uh. Do you think it would would pass for a formal event? <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Do you, do you want my eye to Here twitch back? <laughs> um, uh. the, the man is dead, so I, I, I find it difficult to speak ill of the dead. Um, do you? I... No, not really. <laughs> no, I, I like Sean Connery. I do. Um, he had a lot of great movies. I would I would say he wasn't always the best <laughs> dressed. Like his, uh, there's. No. I remember seeing photos specifically of him with a a sporum with a tassel missing. Now, in fairness, the man didn't give a toss. Like it's he he's right. great for that. Um, and I'm not. I'm not nitpicking and saying, like, how dare he? It's it's not that. It's I'm nitpicking the outfit, not the man. Um, he had a sporin with a tassel missing. He had, I remember seeing pictures of him where he would wear, like, a jabot and then the lace cuffs. Yeah. And one of his lace cuffs was missing. Mm -hmm. So, like, mm -hmm. he was not yeah. always, like, the most, you know, oh, peak, the peak performance of Scottish Highland wear. I remember seeing the... the the tartan tie? The That's, tartan tie. It yeah. was it was the when the, the, the Scottish... Uh, parliament. It was a Scottish Parliament tie. Okay. It was like a green, olive green tie with a blue and, and red on it or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and he's wearing that with a McQueen kilt. Yeah. And he's wearing it with a PC. So it's a tartan full on necktie with a PC yeah. and a different tartan kilt. It was yeah. one of those like, like it, yeah. It, like, it, it, it hurt my brain. Yeah. Um, but yeah. but it's it's not something I would do. He was doing it for a particular thing or for an event or for yeah. you know the you know the red carpet and at a premiere. So it's fine. Or if his if he if he dipped his lace sleeve in his soup it's and fine. had to toss it off. No, it's fine okay, for you, oh. him. I'm not judging him. Would I do it? No. Yeah. Celebrities can get away with things in ways that humans can't. I don't know. But, Celebrities um, can get away with a lot of things. Yeah, whether they should or not. Misogynist. <laughs> Um, but the, uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, I, I, yeah, I've, I've seen a, several different versions that I think most of the ones are ones you alluded to. I think I've seen one where it was a tartan tie that matched the kilt, but it was still a necktie with a PC and it looked a dog's breakfast. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah a, like a long, it. a long necktie. I didn't like it. The reason why we're saying that is a long necktie doesn't feel right with a low cut vest. Mm -hmm. It just feels a touch off. A, a a tartan necktie with a with a five button vest where you see less of it, mm -hmm. then okay fine. I wouldn't wear that for evening necessarily personally. Not for you evening, could, no. I guess, yeah, but yeah. not. Yeah. But, Ian, uh, uh, Ian, our our store manager, wears it and he rocks it, and I'll say he does a good job at it. But that's tweeds. That's day wear. Yes. Not not formal. So um, let me let me play with it a tiny bit. I will say, 
Yeah, no, you don't wear a turtleneck for a freaking formal or semi-formal occasion. Come on. It's not like 1972, all right? Um, that said, I do think... Uh, now, I have worn turtlenecks on a regular basis, especially when I worked downstairs. In the warehouse. Yep. In the warehouse in the winter. Um, a turtleneck with a, a plain jacket, like a tweed jacket or a tweed vest, um, or an unadorned argyle cut jacket, like uh, or the Wallace cut. So basically, one button all the way up to three button jacket, herringbone or uh, a, a Barathea cloth, you know, not black. fancy. Yeah. You know, black is great. Um, you know, antique buttons or bone buttons or modern black, you know, plastic metal buttons, something like that. Not silver, wah, silver bling bling, Klan Nagil buttons can look pretty sharp and you get you get that very modernist kind of you know crisp look going yep. i like that i personally like that but um but that's a day wear option you know that's an autumn to winter day wear option not a uh yeah it's more casual not a dress up option yeah, yeah. that's when you're when you're wintering in the hamptons yeah mm, quite yeah see that's why i don't wear the goatee anymore is because i'd wear the black turtleneck and stuff and people say i looked like anton lave it's true fair or steve jobs even worse. <laughs> Fair. Very good. All right. Was that you or Mac? That was Mac. I had nothing about Sean Connery. <laughs> I had nothing about Sean Connery on, on my yeah, list. Sweet. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> um, okay. This tweed makes me sweaty. <laughs> I like my turtlenecks. Um, now I watch train spotting, actually. <laughs> um... Joel Carden Gibson from YouTube uh, says, uh, my sister is getting married in January and I was given permission to wear a kilt. Do I use the fly plaid or do I do without it? Also, do you need a jacket for a fly plaid or can you wear it with a vest without a jacket? I don't think we need to belabor this one too much. Say it again. Do we wear a, a fly plaid with he wants a... To know, he's, he's, been, he's been granted permission to wear a kilt to a wedding. I'm not sure if he's in the wedding party. I get the impression his sister is getting married. I don't know if he's in the wedding party or not. Okay. Um, he's asking if he should wear a fly plate or not. And no. if he is wearing a fly plate, can he wear it with something other than a jacket? No. No and no. No and no. Um, the fly plate is kilts. In kilts are kind of the peacock in the room, especially if it's not if it's a room of regular guys in suits and you're in a kilt, you are the peacock. Um, so you're already, you know, kind of out there, you know, and, and yeah, you're, you're the peacock period. Um, even if there's other guys in the room, if it's a wedding, I wouldn't wear a fly plate because it's kind of, you're, you're peacocking, you know, squared, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you're, you're taking it up a notch and it's, it's kind of more of a look at me, look at me, look at me when it's not necessarily about you. So the fly plate is something that there's, there's not a lot of reasons to wear it because you are separating yourself from the rest of the people. If you right. are a groom, then that's the perfect time to wear a fly plate. Mm -hmm. um, you can repurpose it maybe to a shawl or to a wrap later on for your bride. You maybe you give it to her or something like that, but you don't get a whole lot of use out of it. But if you're going to get married, that's when you wear it. Would I wear it to a wedding? No. Yeah. No. Would you wear it with anything other than a Prince Charlie or an Argyle jacket? We have a lot of people do this. Um, a lot of Americans do this. It's not supposed to be done. Um, fly plates are meant to be used with a jacket, and particularly a jacket with an epaulette, for it to pass through to keep it where it's supposed to be in the first place, which it won't stay in anyhow. <laughs> Fair point. Uh, but uh, yeah, it is definitely a ceremonial thing. I mean, if you're a groom, if you're officiating, or if you're delivering the address to the haggis or the burn supper, maybe. I don't really have much yeah. use for fly plates personally. They look awesome, but they're a pain in the ass, and they're very much a "I am here to be present." You're, you know, I am, I am in command of the situation. It is a ceremonial kind of a thing. So yeah, yeah. If you're an MC in a sense, you know what I mean. Yeah. But, no, I wouldn't do that. And fly plates are not meant to be worn with Highland shirts. They are not. Yeah. They're not a traditional garment. They are a symbolic garment. I will. I will go two steps further. So yes. You're correct. Do not wear it with a Highland shirt or anything other than a PC or an Argyle. Do not wear it. Do not try to wear it with a vest. Um, and for the love of God, do not wear it with a regular suit. 
Um, mm. We've had people ask us mm. or purchase them and say, hey, I'm going to yep. wear this for the suit. And I'm always kind of the, uh, yeah, okay, that's, that's nice. I hope you have a nice wedding. We've seen some um, things. Yeah, I've seen some things, man. Um, mm-hmm. It's, yeah, just don't do it. Yeah. Not to, not, yeah. But think of it this way. You're, you're going to look sharp, and it's one less thing you have to worry about. So. Indeed. Yeah. All right, Mr. Mack, we'll do one more from you. Okay. We have WH that. What's asking, that? What? Asking, you advise not to mix tartans from different clans, mm-hmm. which makes a ton of sense. Mm-hmm. But what about different tartans from the same clan? Or a different, uh, the same tartan, but a different palette. The, the can you wear you know different tartans of the same clan? Can you wear different tartans in different palettes of the same tartan? So, talking in one outfit to be well, clear. I'm assuming Correct. one outfit. Uh-huh. Yes. Okay. So if it is like Stuart, uh, Stuart uh, dress modern, Stuart dress ancient, or Campbell modern and Campbell ancient, um, in the same outfit, would you do that? It it would I no, it's my my level of matchy matchy is you know is American high, <laughs> therefore it's no I wouldn't do that. It's it it would just look, it would look weird. It would look like you got dressed in the dark or you forgot something or it's like mm-hmm. hmm, why did he do like it, th- those two things are different. Yeah. It would feel a little bit weird. And whether that's color palette or the same clan, it's still like Steward of Appen versus Steward Red. Um, or McDonald right. clam rattle versus regular McDonald tartan. Um, I still probably wouldn't do it. I would just do one and do it well, period. I wouldn't mix and match grab bag it. Yeah, no. I've, I've seen pictures of guys who have done it, um, and it just looks odd. It just looks odd. I want to, because I, I, I try to be creative with this stuff, I want to try and figure out a way that you could do it and get away with it, and I really can't very well. Um, it just doesn't. It just doesn't work in an elegant way in my opinion yeah. it's all about the, f- the feel of it and it doesn't feel to me like it works well yeah um, it uh, again it's yeah it, I'm, I'm not trying not to be harsh but it, it feels like you got dressed in the dark or you just you you grabbed it and accidentally grabbed the one uh, the wrong one kind of thing mm-hmm. um so can it be done do people do it yes uh, am i going to stop you on the street and you know scold you and beat you with an iron rod because you've done that no i'm gonna keep my mouth shut and like oh He's doing a thing. It is what it is. <laughs> but would I do it? No. That is a thing that exists. Yep. Yeah. You, you, only, you only go for that gradient look. <laughs> right. It's like color at the bottom and then gray yeah. at the top. Yeah. All of them. Yes. That's what I mean, I, the, the idea of combining weathered and muted or and modern is an interesting take on it. And I'm trying to imagine it. Like, could you do something like, like a weathered tartan and then like a really, I don't know. Like where were the mattress like the, plaid the, jackets with all the different Stuart tartans like on it? The, yeah, right. Yeah. And Madras. Yeah. It, if it, no, like no, as no. an arch piece, maybe, but it wouldn't be right. But that's different. Yeah, but it would. It would. It's not you know tradition heritage. Well, it's right. kind of heritage, but it's it's different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. I think we have time for one more, Mac. I'll throw to you one more time. Oh, okay. I Let's hope for now. Now I'm just yeah, because that was kind of the short one. Yep. And now I'm putting him on the spot. Okay. Sorry. Um, Not sorry. I love putting one spot. Wiley is asking symmetrical versus asymmetrical. Do you have a preference? Oh, for the love of God, <laughs> symmetrical. Uh, oh, symmetrical. So symmetrical. Yeah. All symmetrical. The uh, asymmetrical tartans are the bane of every freaking kilt maker's existence, period. It is the bane of the people who have to order the cloth and remember that this one <laughs> happens to be a non matching tartan. Um, Asymmetrical, let me let me give you a brief, easy to visualize definition. Here we go. If you have a tartan pattern, let's say this tartan pattern, the American Dream Tartan, available now. <laughs> if you have the a tartan here and you put a mirror right on that yellow line right there, and you look this direction or that direction, it is the exact same thing. If you have an asymmetrical tartan, also known as a non-matching tartan, and you put a mirror on the line, it's not the same on both sides of it. So what ends up happening is when you make a kilt, you have to either use single length cloth or you have to, you can't splice it together. You have to use single length cloth unless you want to hem the bottom of the kilt. So 
No, no asymmetricals should be outlawed from tartan existence. Yeah. Sorry, Buchanan. Well, also, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go further. You're new, the new outlaw clan. <laughs> yes. But centering a line on the front apron. Like, Buchanan is a freaking nightmare because you have, like, that white stripe and then you have, like, a yellow section. The white stripe and the red and then the yellow section. So both of those kind of jump out. So what do you center? If you center the white stripe, then it looks lopsided because there's yellow to one side. If you center the yellow, then the white stripe's on the other side. If you center between them, it just looks like you missed. So it's... Nope, nope, nope. It's okay. It's all right. No, it's not. Shh, 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 shh. I, need, okay. I need my emotional support okay. axe. That's oh. The, Piper Alley. Indeed. Yes. A little nod. A little nod, the, little nod the Piper Alley. All right. Thank you, boys and girls. Now, question of the day. We want to actually know. Give us your honest opinion on the new American Dream Tartan. For those who are joined our show late, this is the tartan that Eric and I are wearing today. It is called the American Dream Tartan. We want to know what are your thoughts on this? Did we knock it out of the park? Is it a bunt? Is it a you know? Is it a foul ball? <laughs> is, it, is it a pop fly mm -hmm. caught in the infield? Tell us your honest opinion on it. What do you think? Um, we played a video at the beginning of the show. We're going to play the video again after we sign off. Um, so those who didn't see it can then see it. So enjoy that video. Until next time, boys and girls. Slanjava. Slanjava. America is known as the land of opportunity. And as we approach our semi-quincentennial anniversary, we began reflecting on what makes America good. Over the last 250 years, why have so many people come to this place in search of a better life? Since our founding in 1776, America has held out a promise to the world, an ideal that we're guided by to this day, the American dream. These simple words encapsulate the concept rooted in optimism and hope. The idea that no matter your ethnicity, your race, your religion, in this place, everyone is able to work towards a better life. Here, your talents and vision and determination shape your own future. Personal freedom and hope, that's the lamp beside the golden door. That's what attracted our immigrant ancestors to America and continues to attract people from all over the world today. We wanted to design a tartan to celebrate that vision of America. For the origins of the American dream, we incorporated 76 blue threads to represent the year our founders made this promise. We included a gold stripe as a nod to Lady Liberty's torch. At the red pivot, we have 13 red stripes to symbolize the original 13 colonies. We utilize three shades of red and three shades of blue to represent the varied backgrounds and experiences of all Americans, those who suffered hardships to work toward their vision of the American dream. This depth and diversity of colors woven together celebrates a beautiful effect, not unlike our country itself. Look, I'm not saying that America's perfect, far from it, but I truly believe that this country has been for centuries and continues to be a beacon of hope. We hold ourselves accountable as good people by using the American dream as our North Star. It's the manifestation of the Founding Fathers' words that we're all created equal with the rights to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. It's the promise of the American dream that makes us good and gives others hope. And we feel that's worth celebrating.